Hello and welcome back to my channel, Quirky What If. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the first part of our series, What If Deku Had Cursed Blood? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Magnus9284 from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Cursed Blood. Chapter 1. A Sinister Origin. Izuku Midoriya was a four-year-old who already knew what he wanted to be when he grew up. What to aim for in his life, he wanted to be a hero, someone who could save anyone in need with a smile on his face. This was why he couldn't wait for these tests to finish, for the doctor to finally come and announce what his amazing quirk was. And Ko Midoriya watched her bouncing baby boy with a warm smile on her face, knowing better than to even attempt to bring his excitement down with reality. She knew that with her quirk being so weak, and her husband's being only mildly useful, Izuku's chances at developing anything powerful were rather low. But as they say, hope is the last to die. Well, the results are ready. The elderly doctor, clad in round glasses and a protruding belly, announced as he entered the room, gaining the attention of the duo. Is it something amazing? Izuku asked quickly, I hope it's something amazing. The smile stretched across his little face showed no sign of fading, even in the face of the doctor's rather serious gaze. And Ko watched with growing dread as the doctor rubbed the bridge of his nose before dropping heavily into a chair, surely a clear sign of the man working to find the words to describe a terrible prognosis. The mother worried at what those words could possibly be. The horrible word, Q-U-I-R-K-L-E-S-S, flashed before her mind's eye. Well, it's unusual, but nothing too amazing. We've discovered that your blood produces and houses special microorganisms. These microorganisms appear to retain the basic genetic information of their host, you, and whenever an anomaly of any kind is detected. Say for instance structural damage such as broken tissue or bones or internal irregularities like bacterial or viral infections, they immediately go about repairing or erasing that anomaly. The doctor explained all of this while flipping through the papers he'd carried in with him. Peering over the edge of his papers and glasses, he noticed the confused stares of the mother and son before him. In layman's terms, you appear to have a rarely seen type of regeneration quirk. But it doesn't seem to be extreme in any way. And Ko, taking in the information she could understand, suddenly snapped her fingers. Well, that explains why he's never been sick. The mother announced, reminiscing on how healthy her son had been up to now, not even suffering a single bout of colic as a newborn. But, it's good, right, I can be a hero that. Izuku began to speak, his voice denoting both obvious disappointment at not getting to be as strong as his idol, and resolute strength in embracing the idea of becoming a less extreme hero. The doctor's cold glare silenced him. You'd better give up on that dream, kid. You may be able to heal ten times faster than the average person, but this isn't a quirk that's going to stop a bullet or make you stronger. You'd be better at something like hospital work or handling biological material in experiments. The doctor's words were delivered flatly, without regard to the boy's feelings, as if he wanted to crush his dreams. Doctor, isn't that a little extreme? I mean, maybe these micro thingies are capable of more or will be as he grows up. And Ko threw out her thoughts on the matter, trying to cheer up her son. Her words earned a small smile from the now teary-eyed little boy. I know what you're trying to do, but please, this isn't an emitter quirk, the doctor said, turning to the woman. Your son's quirk acts like a mutant type. And in most cases with mutants, we know improving is next to impossible. It doesn't help that these microorganisms die, without fail, less than 30 minutes after leaving their host's body. Chances for development, let alone research, seems to be impossible. Standing, the doctor handed over some paperwork for Inko to complete. Izuku began to feel like a failure. All of his dreams of saving people with a smile were quickly going up in smoke, leaving his future unclear, uncertain. Later that night, Inko woke from her fitful slumber to a sudden noise, one that she'd heard many times before. The sound of that particular video that her son loved to watch tickled at the edges of her hearing. Still half asleep, the mother reached the door to her son's room, dreading having to take a look inside, dreading what she feared she'd find. Izuku, Inko called as she slowly pushed the door open. Framed by a single glowing computer screen in a room full of darkness sat her son. Slowly, he turned to her, his face full of fearful tears. Him mom, can I be a hero, like all might? Izuku asked with a trembling voice, trying to grasp at anything that resembled hope. Hope for his dream. Inko quickly grabbed him up in a hug, trying to pour every last drop of love she had into him. She hugged him through all of her own tears, feelings of hopelessness, and the heart-shattering realization that she had failed her son. Yes, ye, of course you can, even if not like all might. You can be a hero, Inko replied with what little strength she could muster. The acrid taste of lying to her son sat heavily on her tongue. Ten years later, this is pointless, Izuku muttered as he sat on the doorstep of an abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. Izuku had been left there during the school's camping trip, an annual tradition, as a test of valor, part of the trip itself. But over the years he'd become used to taking the role of punching bag of his fellow classmates. And that applied doubly so for his once best friend, Katsuki Bekugo. 
once the blonde's quirk of secreting self-detonating nitroglycerin like sweat had became public and was compared against his own, but Hugo had made it his personal mission to make his life hell. A total waste of time. Izuku continued his muttering, taking the time to indulge in his depressing pastime, reminiscing on his life. He almost wished he'd been born quirkless sometimes. Maybe then he'd at least have been shown some pity, or stopped clinging so tightly to the dream of being a hero. Or at the very least Bakugo would have been less aggressive in his bullying. He still remembered when, at seven years old, he'd attempted to help his longtime friend after he'd fallen in a shallow river and in thanks had been pushed away head first onto an outcropping of sharp rocks nearby. The severe wounds had closed and healed in under a minute before everyone's eyes, revealing a yet undiscovered attribute of his quirk. On that day, Bakugo had found the perfect punching bag, one too hard to kill, but too useless for anyone to care about. Completely useless, he'd said. BFT. Izuku almost spat in self-pity. Instead, he decided to summon a happier memory, one where he'd felt useful, almost like a hero. He'd been twelve when he'd faced his first instance of real, life-and-death violence meant to kill. He'd been hiding from his habitual tormentor during a late evening walk home when he'd heard it. The scream. A girl's scream. Before he'd even had time to think, he darted into the nearby dark alley and tackled the first body he encountered. The man had turned out to be twice his size in height and weight, his charge only successful in throwing the thug off balance due to its suddenness. The girl had taken the chance to run, never looking back. For his trouble, he'd been stabbed seven times. The wounds were gone before he picked himself up off the ground, not that it had helped calm his frantic mother. It doesn't matter if anyone knows, Izuku said to himself with a tiny smile, as long as that girl ended up okay. Around him, he noticed the sun was setting and the cold was beginning to creep in. Any camper caught unaware would surely end up with frostbite. Not that Izuku, the Regenerator had anything to worry about. Regenerator, the name he'd given his quirk. The moniker defined the fact that he'd heal back from any wound or sickness at abnormal speed. He just wished he'd been able to test it against something worse than the average cold or the cuts and scrapes of bullying. Unfortunately, being labeled as a mutant type had led to none being willing to test his limits or go beyond them. And don't even get him started on his mother. If they had, maybe he'd know why the little friends in his blood died soon after leaving his body. Or maybe he'd know why his healing factor so greatly exceeded the doctor's original projections. His stabbing had shown him that his wounds closed almost instantly, with little bleeding. But here he was, largely in the dark about himself. I wish, I wish you guys could do more outside my body. Maybe then I could be a healing hero, like Recovery Girl, Izuku said toward his arm, a habit formed from too many lonely school days. Others had laughed and picked on him even more for it, but it was something he'd never stopped doing. Probably because he could feel his very veins tickle every time he talked to them. It was almost like they'd talk back. In the distance, the waning moon ascended, bringing its pitiful light to shroud the world in an ominous luminescence. Having long since become accustomed to surviving on his own in situations such as this, Izuku quickly made a campfire with ease. Really, he only bothered with it to keep the wildlife away, it wasn't like he'd freeze to death. His blood never allowed his internal temperature to drop at all, a fortunate side effect that unfortunately didn't cross over too well into heat resistance. He just wished he wouldn't have to suffer the intense hunger pangs whenever he'd have to heal up too much. I bet everyone is having a good time with their marshmallows and hot cocoa. Izuku descended into his dark mutterings once again, remembering that he was the only one repeatedly tested with spending nights alone in the woods. The other kids just had to walk along a small path in the middle of the night, one very close to the main camp, and got to keep their electricity and other commodities. Whatever. It's not like I really wanted to spend time with them. Happy birthday. To me, Izuku finished his muttering with a somber expression on his face. He couldn't refrain from thinking on how this night was similar to so many others. Spent all alone. I wish I'd thought to bring my notebooks, Izuku groused. At least then his unhappiness would have just been nominal, but without his working material he felt in moroseness only increase. He loved thinking on ways to make use of his quirk to be a hero, even though it had been incredibly difficult to come up with any ideas beyond serving as a meat shield. The night continued its course, unconcerned about the young boy and his depression, unconcerned about the hell about to break loose. Suddenly, the soft roar of a distant truck engine filtered through the regular nightscape white noise. Accelerating at an uneven pace, as if either chasing or fleeing something, the roaring sharply rose in volume. Izuku's mind was quick to formulate two theories on this abrupt development. Either it was a case of villains attempting to escape local authorities and something he was better off staying away from, or worse, an innocent was on the run from villains. It was the second possibility that had him moving toward the largely unused road ahead. What if, by chance, someone really was in danger? What if he could help that person? Help. A sudden, terrified scream had Izuku running forward without thinking that it had been the voice of a girl, one that seemed to be in pain and scared, was undeniable. Over here, Izuku shouted into the night, hoping to guide the girl to safety. Soon, the shaking and shuffling of foliage announced the arrival of the owner of the voice. Oh god, Izuku whispered as he saw a form step from the shadows. The small lantern he'd hidden away from the other students, with the help of the meager moonlight, managed to illuminate the girl. He could easily make out tattered rags and a terrified facial expression. 
Then the truck burst onto the scene, along with the glint of the gun being wielded by the driver. Watch out, Izuku shouted as he tackled the girl to the side, just as the gun was fired. Searing pain exploded along his back as five bullets struck him, causing him to roll multiple times before coming to a stop. Now lying on his side, Izuku could do nothing but look at the girl as she stared back at him with sorrowful eyes, her mouth filling with blood as her lips traced the words of a muted apology. He never heard the truck as it stopped, nor the figure of the driver as it stood over him. He did hear the first of two gunshots however. Kids these days, always wanting to play hero without considering the consequences, the figure said, voice high enough to register as feminine. A practiced motion followed, and the gun was effortlessly reloaded. Just remember, this is all your fault. He died because you ran away from the job I so kindly gave you. You want it out. Well, here's your out. The figure stared the bleeding girl in the eye, unblinking, and emptied the entire new clip into her. As the last echoes of the execution faded, the night fell into uneasy silence, broken only by the fading roar of the retreating truck. Izuku waited until he could no longer hear anything save for the tentative cries of the Higurashi to move, quickly sitting up. Tensing his aching back, he let out gasping breaths as his body spit out the numerous bullets that had burrowed into him. Standing, he rushed to the girl, unconcerned with whether or not his wounds had closed properly. His only objective was the girl, there had to be something he could do to save her. Come on, don't die, please don't die, you're too pretty to die. Izuku nearly shouted at the girl as he wrapped his arms under hers and dragged her into the abandoned cabin. Once he reached the wooden structure, he noticed that miraculously his phone was not only intact, but mostly charged and retaining good reception. Please, stay with me, just a little longer. Please. Izuku pressed his left hand against the girl's wounds, a seemingly futile attempt to prevent her death, while he used his right to dial the police's emergency number. The concept of travel time and terrain restrictions never crossed his panicked mind. Hello? The quick response of the operator gave the green-haired boy hope, his belief in the girl's survival bolstered. P please SS send help, SHG's be bleed. Izuku, his fear eating him from the inside out, was unable to control his stammering. This line is for real emergencies kid, not childish nightmares. The operator tiredly grumbled, why don't you just go back to sleep? There was a clicking sound, and the line was cut. He'd been ignored. No, 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 no. Izuku began to slip further into his panic, dialing the next number he could think of for more immediate help. Thiaye, Midoriya Chan, do you really want to lose the hick? Challenge. Izuku hung up as soon as he realized the slurred voice that had answered was that of his teacher. Out of options, he thought of the only person who'd never say no to the idea of helping him. Mom, please, help. Izuku whispered through the phone as soon as his call had been picked up. All thoughts of being bullied for running to mommy had long since been thrown out, replaced by the single-minded desire to save the life of the girl dying in front of him. Suddenly, the girl began to heave, her skin ghostly pale and chilled. Izuku knew these symptoms from health class, the girl was going into shock. He also knew that if she wasn't stabilized soon, death was assured. Acting instinctively, he dropped his phone and searched the cabin for anything that would help. Besides a useless cot, there was only a pocket knife. Izuku looked at the girl. The knife. The girl. His wrist. If there's even the smallest chance you guys can help. This is it, Izuku said with apprehension. Quickly, before the tickles could begin, he raised the knife to his skin and cut his wrist. Come on. Please. Heal her. Izuku begged through freely falling tears. Fighting through the stinging pain shooting up from his wrist, he directed the gushing appendage to spill its treasure over any open wounds he could see. After a minute, in a generous dosage of blood, he moved his hemorrhaging wrist to the girl's mouth. To his surprise, the lips turned away, the girl gritting her teeth to speak through her tremors. Don't. Do. Th that. I'm. Filthy. Her final breath taken, the girl collapsed, a puppet with its strings cut. Izuku's panic reached maximum and, mindlessly, he jumped into giving the girl CPR. Twenty minutes passed before the raving screams from his mother coming from his forgotten phone pulled him back to reality. Gently, he picked the device up, addressing his mother through her cries. Mom, I, I need you. The sheer haunted quality of her son's voice cutting Ko off mid-ramble. Izuku swallowed thickly, I, I couldn't save her. I, I couldn't be a hero. Lost in his own shock, Izuku stared listlessly at his greatest failure. He was unbothered by the knowledge that the rags that adorned the girl hardly covered her private parts, that she was obviously not wearing underwear, that scars and bruises covered more of her skin than not. Only one thing repeated in his mind, over and over again. He was a useless kid after all. Just a failure. Dawn, the police cars and ambulance arrived in front of the abandoned cabin just as the sun began to rise over the horizon. From one of the cars burst one in Komitoria, utterly drowning in her overly active imagination's fears regarding her son. Her eyes scanned the area, searching for her baby boy. Soon enough she found him, sitting on the cabin's porch, by the closed front door. I see you, you. And Ko screamed in anguish as she reached her distraught son, who looked as if he hadn't stopped crying until he physically couldn't produce any more tears. Mom, I think I'm cursed, were the only words Izuku uttered as he was engulfed within the fierce embrace of his mother. This only served to increase the poor woman's distress. Don't say that. You did everything you could, more even. 
No hero could say the same here. And Ko nearly shouted as she gave her baby kisses on his head. She knew, call it maternal instinct, that her son was going through his life's most dire moment to date. He'd given his all to save someone, be a hero like he'd always wanted, and failed. It's okay kid, we'll take it from here, announced the cop, a young woman with close cropped hair that had driven the car and Ko had arrived in. The uniformed woman reached for the door of the cabin, but froze when the boy she and her co-workers had been sent to find seized her wrist. She made a mental note that the boy's grip was much too strong for one his age. Miss Officer, do you have a gun? It wasn't so much the question that scared both the cop and Inko, but the disturbed look that gazed out from Izuku's eyes. Izuku, Inko hesitantly took a step towards her son. I am sorry. I swear I didn't mean to. Izuku suddenly cried in distress, incredible guilt weighing his words. All right, kid. Why don't you take a breath and calmly explain what you did, the cop suggested sweetly, before adding, and why I need my gun to go into the cabin. Fully expecting the little boy to confess to staring at the naked body of the victim, or perhaps even to touching it as his puberty-driven hormones came into play, she was not prepared for the reality of the answer. In my quirk, I, I heal abnormally fast. I, it's my blood you see. I, I tried to use it. On her, bashfully, Izuku lifted his mudded shirt, revealing fading scars that the cop immediately recognized as bullet wounds. Months old bullet wounds by all appearances. And Ko nearly fainted on the spot, her worst fears confirmed. Someone had tried to kill her baby, shot him multiple times over in fact, and if it weren't for his regeneration they'd have succeeded. And even with his quirk, she knew he'd felt every agonizing second of his injuries. So, is she dead or not? The uniformed woman asked, apprehensive now. Police academy and in-service training scenarios relating to uncontrolled quirk use flashed through her mind. She really hoped they weren't going to have to deal with an angry and disoriented villain now. No, I mean, yes, I mean, you may need to, use, your gun. Is comforted by the child's nonsensical answer, the policewoman readied her gun while Inko, still wrapping her son in her arms, stepped the two away from the cabin's door. Just in case. Okay, you two, stay here while I check things inside, the policewoman said as she steeled herself. She could do this. She's seen just how wild and unpredictable uncontrolled quirk use could get. This wasn't going to be anything she couldn't handle. Gun first, the policewoman slowly entered the cabin. Instantly, her mind set about cataloging the large pool of blood in the center of the room, the metal lumps that had to be used bullets, there were a lot of them, and the bloody footprints that led to a corner of the room where the victim stood. The victim stood. Jerking back, the policewoman frantically swung her gun up and around. The victim was eerily pale, cause unknown, though her hair was new moon midnight black and fell straight down to her waist. It was obvious that it was a her, as the bits of cloth that could be considered clothes did next to nothing to provide modesty as the girl stood there in all of her six feet. Oh God, she was standing. Young lady, are you okay? Do you need medical attention? Help of any kind? The policewoman asked the standardized questions as she took small steps forward, gun slightly lowered. The girl, whose head had been bowed, straightened and faced forward. Now the policewoman could see that it wasn't clothes she was wearing, but the remains of a sackcloth dress cut to serve as impromptu clothing. She knew from records that this was often seen with girls who'd been sold as sex slaves, the now visible scars crisscrossing the girl's body leading credence to this line of thinking. Who? The girl groaned, her lifeless red eyes staring through the policewoman. Unsure if she'd been understood, the uniformed woman tried again. Iido, why don't you come over here? The policewoman asked, we can get you checked out. At the edges of her mind, an unsettling word, a thought, began to take root. She really wanted to ignore its possibility. Ugh. Another groan. The girl took a step forward, but in every way the movement appeared unnatural. It was more jerkish than a limp, but smoother than a wholly robotic movement. It was as if something else moved the girl's body. You know what? No. All right. Better just stay there. I'll call the experts. The policewoman finally succumbed to her fear. She wasn't dealing with a sick or injured person. This was an honest-to-God reanimated corpse. Him -him -uh. The slightly louder moan, accompanied by the corpse beginning a swaying motion, was all it took for the policewoman to panic and, without warning, shoot her entire clip dead center into the chest of the thing before her. The girl barely reacted. Hey, there were no words for the emotions running through the policewoman as she watched the girl peer down at her bullet-riddled chest for a brief moment before turning an empty red-eyed glare her way. When the growling started, she dropped her gun, turned, and fled, hoping to move faster than the girl fitfully striding after her. And in a woe, -wo, the policewoman screamed as she burst from the cabin, tripping as she reached the gravel outside. And Co watched in utter horror as the officer landed almost in front of her just as a pale, dark-haired girl nearly flew out of the cabin after her. The young girl looked to be in a feral rage and the green-haired woman immediately moved to shield her son from the coming violence when, Stop! Izuku shouted. The girl immediately froze, all momentum suddenly gone, as she stood, back straight, seeming to be awaiting further command. Did, did you just? The policewoman broke herself off, half expecting this to be a dream, half expecting it to be a nightmarish reality. Izuku, you, did this, and Ko ventured to ask, doing her best to convey love and understanding in the face of the situation. I'm sorry mom. 
I, I think my quirk makes zombies, Izuku said, guilt darkening his face, regret deadening his voice. It's okay baby, you didn't know this would happen. You didn't do it on purpose. I'm sure this won't cause you any problems. Isn't that right, officer? And Ko assured as she looked to the policewoman with pleading eyes. Of course you're in big trouble. Young man, what you did was, a growl was all it took to cause the policewoman's words to die in her throat. The rumbling was deeper this time, almost as if denoting. Hatred. Why did I have to have such a horrible quirk? I must be cursed. Izuku cried. He didn't want this. This would only bring him more problems. I'm sorry, Izuku. It's my fault, not yours, Inko cried too, holding herself responsible for this disaster. She's the one who couldn't even give her son a better quirk. Running back to her car, the policewoman called for immediate backup. The single other officer that had gone to clear the area wasn't going to be enough to deal with this. As it was, she couldn't bear to take her eyes off the zombie. It had to be dangerous. It had to be. Every movie ever pointed to the creatures being infectious and rabid. Calling on every quirk report she'd ever had to schlep through as a rookie, her memory recalled the fact that there were other zombie maker quirks out there, so someone had to know what to do now. Hours later, local police station. Izuku and Nko sat in the small, rather plain office, patiently waiting for the station chief to direct them as to the procedures they were to follow now. Besides knowing they needed to deal with the new development of the younger's quirk, the only reassurances the two had received had been that there would be no charges or fines for what had happened. Are you alright? Does it hurt? Inko asked to her baby boy once again, intently searching over his torso and the holes in his shirt. Izuku lifted the piece of cloth to show his naked chest and back in an obvious show of obedience and understanding. Not anymore mom. Izuku patted his front, now showing unblemished skin and no signs of ever having been hurt in the first place. But this is good, right? Izuku said, now we know bullets can't kill me. Too bad my body didn't shield her though. Covering himself again, the green-haired boy directed his eyes to the mistake he'd made. The undead girl stood by his side, lifeless eyes lost to a distant horizon. The presently vacant expression she sported denoted lack of any active intelligence or will. This had made the trek from the cabin additionally nightmarish. Unwilling to have the girl sit next to her in her vehicle, the policewoman's reticence had Izuku suffering being squished in the back of the cruiser with a corpse while Inko was left to constantly fret over her son's position in the front. While Inko's situation was unfortunate, the adults had found that Izuku's presence was the only thing keeping the monster calm and quiet. Reaching the station hadn't improved matters by much. Both Izuku and the zombie girl were immediately subjected to a barrage of medical tests, only the green-haired boy's command forcing the undead girl to comply. Unfortunately, having his blood drawn for samples proved to be too much for the accidental monster who'd become enraged at the sight. Izuku managed to calm the girl after repeated commands, and no one was hurt, but all present remained spooked afterwards. Izuku, the human body isn't meant to stop bullets. Don't you dare jump in the way like that again. What would have happened if you had been shot in the head? And Ko admonished her son, her worry made evident that she just wanted him to be safe. He'd probably survive. The station chief followed his statement into the room, scrunching his nose at the fetid odor that filled his office. Holding on to his professionalism, he refrained from commenting on it. The two Midoriya stood, bowing to the man. He appeared well above his forties, and sported a receding hairline, but overly large arms that strained the seams of his shirt. Excuse me, and Ko, obviously horrified at the prospect of her baby son being shot in the head or anywhere to start with, gasped. I would, Izuku asked with a frown, not knowing if that was good or not, or why the chief though such was possible. You survived gunshots to the heart, lungs, and the liver. At the same time, I've seen many a regeneration quirk during my career, but yours is the most prolific by far, the chief explained as he took his seat, shuffling the files on his hands. Are you sure it's a mutant type? Well, that's what the doctor said. And it's not like he consciously goes about ordering his blood to heal him, it just happens, and Co explained for his son, who limited himself to nodding. He didn't want to start stuttering now. I see. Anyway, let's start by addressing the less than deceased here. We were able to find a match in our database. This here is T. Yamada. The chief began to read a file, taking glances between the zombie and the picture in the profile. Oh, that's great. Izuku, at the very least we can return her to. No, I'm sorry. Says here she was disowned by her parents for running away with her boyfriend, who was also her idol manager in the making. Well, that's what it says here anyway, the chief interrupted. He coughed in the face of what followed in the file. She was registered to missing persons by her friends when they couldn't contact her after an entire month of trying. Unfortunately this scenario fits the mo. A certain ring of traffickers uses to pull in victims for trafficking. Poor girl. But why? And Ko was quick to pity the zombie girl, who appeared unaware that the conversation was about her. Well, she's quirkless for one, and came from a troubled family. The chief continued, I know it sounds cruel, but some people tend to use their quirkless members as bargain chips, offering up girls like T as brides in exchange for social status, or as a way to ensure they can marry at all. Nowadays, it's not as if many, heroes included, desire normal companionship. Both mother and son gasped at the truth of their society, though Nko was less surprised than she let on. Now, continuing with the report. 
Ms. Yamada presents numerous scars corresponding to physical abuse, signs of forced abortions. At least six STDs came up as positive, with a few of her internal organs showing the typical degradation caused by such. In fact, the fetid odor I'm sure you noticed is more than likely a result of this degradation. The chief would have continued his explanation, but paused at the horrified look and co-shot her son's way. And no, your son is perfectly clean, even when he had such close contact with her. We were only able to test for STDs though, as his blood's short lifespan doesn't seem to have changed since the original tests. Izuku hadn't even considered disease transfer during the haze of his panic. Hearing that he was in the clear now caused him no small relief. Relief shared by Inko in no small measure. Now, to address your situation Mr. Midoriya, the chief regained their attention, making mother and son go stiff in response to seriousness of his voice. Why yes 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 sir. Izuku cursed his typical stutter, though it softened the face of the chief. Son, I'm afraid to be the one to tell you this. But you're now the owner of a reanimated corpse, the chief declared, sounding for all the world as if he'd just passed a life sentence. Maybe he had. What? Mother and son exclaimed at the same time, neither of them even considering they'd be keeping the zombie. There is no third party we can contact to reclaim the body, the chief began his explanation. In addition, she no longer has legal documentation proving her identity. More importantly, according to the quirk laws regarding the quirk registry, your powers must be studied in every aspect presented. This means we need to know how long you can keep her moving and when she stops for good. Upon such occurring you will be required to report to the registry for further instructions and perhaps even surrender the body for further study by the local authority. Is, is this legal? For me to, keep her, Izuku asked, avoiding with all his might suggesting that he'd own the girl beside him. That is how it's worded, and that's what the higher-ups said over the phone, the chief assured before fixing Izuku with a stern look, that being said, necrophilia is still illegal. Midoriya residence. Hours later, Izuku, Inko, and their new friend arrived home emotionally drained and intensely hungry. The camping trip had been all but forgotten, overwritten by the pressing need to feel clean after everything they'd just been through. With matching heavy sighs and a groan from their newest member, they stumbled through their front door. Mom, do you think I can be a hero? Izuku asked while looking at the zombie girl with apologetic eyes. And Ko's heart ached at his plea and the obviously dark thoughts crossing his mind. Yes, my baby boy, you can. Maybe. Maybe she can do the heavy lifting, and you can focus on using your wonderful mind. And Ko replied, liking the idea of her son staying away from danger, even if that meant using a poor corpse as a meat shield. Yeah, maybe. Izuku wasn't convinced, but decided to drop the subject, favoring the idea of taking a long bath to think things over. He decided he'd go to bed early, he needed time to make plans regarding how to approach his quirk, and how he was going to deal with school. Well now, come help me to give this girl a bath, she needs a good cleaning, and Ko said, a sudden idea for helping her son gain a little confidence after his ordeal popping into her head. It would also reduce the fetid odor that had followed their newest member home. Hopefully, what? Izuku nearly had a heart attack at the order he'd been given. Or maybe he had. He probably wouldn't even notice. That day, Izuku learned more about women than he'd ever had in sex ed class. First Blood Chapter 2 A Sinister Resolve Six months had passed since the incident in the forest, and it had been six months of problems for the boy with cursed blood. While the first week after had been given to him by the school to take time to heal, mostly his mind due to his healing factor, and Ko hadn't easily accepted such a short reprieve. She'd argued that Izuku had suffered a major trauma and needed more time, but the principal had insisted, pointing to the boy's lack of need for medical attention, and he'd been forced to return before either Midoriya felt ready. This is a waste of time, Izuku whispered as he finished his test less than 15 minutes after it had begun. He knew beyond a doubt he'd aced it, so he'd just spend the time thinking. As embarrassing as it had been, Izuku almost would have preferred it if he could go back to that first week, it had been an enlightening period after all. Not only had he learned way too much about female anatomy, he'd also received a crash course in the etiquette involved with dealing with the opposite sex. While T had obviously been completely cooperative, his mother had insisted that he learn everything possible about her and how to treat her. That, as it turned out, included how to dress her and make her presentable. Let's hope mom makes lots for dinner tonight, Izuku whispered over to T, who stood by his side dressed in her now customary green tracksuit. The garb easily succeeded in concealing her curves, but more importantly it hid any signs of her being undead. What do you think? After that rather informative week, he'd finally returned to school. In pandemonium, the principal had forgotten to inform the teachers about his extra baggage that he would be bringing with him, that he had a right to keep bringing with him. Rumors had immediately spread like wildfire. Izuku had hired an actress to simulate an upgrade of his quirk. He'd sold batches of his blood to buy a slave to do his bidding. His mentally challenged cousin had been disowned and he'd taken her in for favors. It wasn't until Bakugo had tried to start up his bullying routine again that it became obvious to all that something wasn't right with the green-haired boy. Ugh. T let out a soft groan in response, one of the reasons her true nature hadn't remained hidden for very long. Raising a brow, Izuku was pretty sure that was the zombie girl's way of agreeing to something. He still doubted she actually understood him though. M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A. Keep that abomination of yours quiet and on a short leash. The teacher shouted, fear evident. 
since he'd begun bringing tea with him, Izuku no longer had teachers walking to his seat or even a piece of chalk thrown his way. The zombie girl had proven to be harder to deal with than an overly aggressive Doberman. Fucking Romero, that Hugo muttered loud enough for all to hear. On cue, the rest of the students began to mutter amongst themselves. Romero, that was his new nickname. It might have been better than Deku, but Izuku had ended up hating it even more. Not even a week after returning to school, Bakugo had confronted him, looking to put him in his place. Apparently he'd taken offense to the rumors of him hiring a girl as a bodyguard. The explosive blonde hadn't gotten farther than grabbing the collar of Izuku's shirt before T had darted forward, digging her nails into his face. Before the green-haired teen had been able to separate the two, Bakugo had blown off half the undead girl's face in retaliation. The results weren't pretty. It had been the first time the blonde had used his quirk against another person without checking his power. When the smoke had cleared, raw and charred muscle, a glassed eye, and free-flowing blood had caused the surrounding witnesses to grow faint. But it was T unflinchingly charging at him again through it all that finally made Bakugo back away in horror. When Izuku had finally managed to get the zombie girl to calm down, the class had been aghast to see her skin and eye regenerating back to perfect condition, saying they'd all been horrified would have been an extreme understatement. He'd heard that the school had even had to hire a temporary counselor for some of them. Professor, we're going outside, Izuku said, not bothering to ask. Since he'd already gained the attention of the teacher, who usually did his best to ignore the two if at all possible, he'd decided to make use of it. W.H., you know what, the teacher said, cutting himself off. Just go. Izuku was once again thankful for the coward not wanting to expose the other students to his abomination any more than necessary. I'll be feeding T-chan if anyone needs me. Izuku replied with a neutral tone, sending shivers through everyone in the classroom. Needless to say, he was out in less than five minutes. In the relatively short amount of time he'd spent with the zombie girl, Izuku had learned quite a bit. One important discovery was that T's organs were largely non-functional at this point, feeding her wasn't really necessary. She no longer had any real need for food, the bathroom, or even air. Even so, she still asked for food occasionally. He chalked it up to an ingrained instinct to seek out nourishment. His mother had at first attempted to serve their new family member her own homemade food, but it quickly became obvious to them that the undead girl preferred something more. Unconventional. God fucking damn it. Izuku yelled, slamming a fist into the wall of the staircase at the rooftop of the school. He was so fed up with how the school had been treating him, and T, that he didn't even feel the breaking of three of his fingers or the tearing of the skin of his knuckles. He'd proven time and again that she was perfectly harmless unless he was physically endangered. But no, they were still all but demanding that he put an honest-to-God muzzle on the zombie girl. Him, uh, speaking of, T quickly grabbed his newly broken hand and started licking the wounds. The zombie girl continued slurping at the bloodied limb until it had completely regenerated, only a minute passing. Why? Why do you still act so kind and caring toward me? Izuku asked his undead companion in distress, the sight of T licking his injury reminding him that he'd been lying to everyone. Aren't I the reason you died? Aren't I the reason you're still getting hurt? Aren't I the one who's refusing to let you go? Four weeks into their new lives, Izuku had noticed with mixed feelings that T had started to act stranger than normal. Her movements slowed considerably, appearing to take great effort and instead of just sticking close to him she'd taken every opportunity to lick him. Using the wonder of search engines, it hadn't taken him long to discover the zombie girl was exhibiting early signs of rigor mortis. His quirk had finally begun to lose its grip on the poor girl. Initially, he'd been relieved, believing it had been a good thing. It was going to be T's opportunity to finally rest as she'd always deserved. Then, he'd begun to panic. Perhaps it was purely unlucky the timing that his quirk had reached the end of its natural lifespan, but only the previous day Izuku had come to a realization. Undead as she was, T was abnormally strong for a quirkless, held no fear or hesitation in the face of pain or death, and was relatively inexhaustible. She was everything he needed to be a hero, he'd create the strategies and T would do the heavy lifting. It'd be no different than any of the other heroes with pet controlling quirks. Seeing T dying for a second time had stopped him cold, he was going to lose his chance to be a hero. Keeping the zombie girl moving had instantly become an all-consuming focus. Turning his overproductive mind to the task, Izuku had quickly decided to try giving up more of his blood. He banked on the hypothesis that the attempts at licking him were a compromise between the undead girl's desire for nourishment and her inability to harm him. With all of his resolve to become a hero potently mixed with the sheer terror of being caught, he'd snuck an unused syringe from the first aid kit his mother kept in the bathroom. Luckily it had never been used, only bought it all before the discovery his quirk made worrying over injuries or sicknesses slightly moot. Izuku had determinedly fought through the nerve-wracking and painful ordeal of plunging the needle into his own flesh and siphoning the needed blood. Injecting it into tea had turned out to be as simple as finding the biggest vein in her arm and stabbing once. Miraculously, in less than half an hour tea had regained much of her mobility, a healthier appearance, and in Izuku's opinion, a happier disposition. T-chan, I wish you could tell me what to do, Izuku said to his companion. It would be so much easier if I knew I had to let you go or could keep you with me. Fishing out a piece of beef jerky from his extra bento, he placed it in the zombie girl's awaiting mouth. Happily, T began to chew on the dried meat. 
Watching her munch away, the green-haired teen counted at least one blessing as a stray wind began to kick up. At least that odor's gone, he remarked, smiling lightly. I sure hope you at least feel cleaner now. Having lived with her for so long, it had only been recently that the Midoriya matriarch and son had realized that the undead addition to their family no longer exuded a putrid aroma. In one of his notebooks, Izuku had ended up hypothesizing that his blood must have finally eradicated the STDs that had plagued T in life. Regardless, his mother had made sure to remind him no crimes could be committed with the zombie girl's body. They continued to use the same mix of incense and rose essence though. No one had yet to complain about the pleasant smell, except for Bakugo, who stated that it made him sick, and no one knew if T's body could or would begin to decay as long as his blood was present. It was better to be safe than sorry. Needless to say, Izuku had come to love the perfume. After school, basking in the solitude they'd been able to enjoy for months now once Bakugo began to actively avoid them, Izuku and T walked home in companionable silence. Deciding to put times like this to good use, the green-haired teen had been trying to teach T how to walk more, humanly, and overall look less haunting. In his opinion, he'd had some degree of success. T-chan, we're going to have to train a lot more with entrance exams so close, Izuku said to the zombie girl, who lulled her head to the side in response. So, etiquette or power? T groaned, lulling her head back to its normal position. You're right, Izuku agreed, feeling he knew approximately what the noise had meant. We've really got to polish your behavior under duress. It'd suck if we were disqualified due to a sudden urge to bite. It wasn't that he didn't feel the need to work on building power, it was just that at this point he'd hit something of a plateau. Throughout the months that had passed Izuku had taken up trainings of all sorts. In the mornings he'd take early jogs, lifted some weights, and had even thrown the occasional punch against a tree. After a homemade lunch from his mother, he'd gotten right back to it until the sun went down or he'd been called home for the night. From all of that work, he'd discovered that gaining any noticeable muscle would be incredibly difficult for him. And T, the zombie girl had been an easy enough guest due to the nature of being undead, but his own lack of growth had seemed unreasonable. That was, until he'd gone to save a cat. After school one random afternoon, Izuku had found a kitten trapped below a tree trunk that must have fallen during the previous night storm. With no one else around to help, he had expected to work up quite the sweat to rescue the little critter. To his shock, he and T had easily moved the massive trunk. After calming down, Izuku had gone straight into his muttering analytics mode. Shortly after, he'd come to the conclusion that T's undead body no longer had subconscious limiters tied to her physical capabilities. She could unleash all of her strength regardless of resulting self-damage. For himself, after a bit of embarrassing self-examination and fumbling, he'd found that instead of increasing the size of his muscles he was actually developing more muscle fibers. Luckily for him, the fact he'd never be as buff as All Might hadn't even registered in the face of the benefits of being able to grow stronger without adding bulky mass. It was no super strength, not by quirk standards, but it was better than quirkless strength. We've also got to do something about this hunger, Izuku groused, rubbing his stomach. Man, I wonder if we can get something like a burger to go on the way ho, T-chan. Izuku stopped, turning in the middle of the tunnel they'd been walking through to shoot a questioning glance at his partner. T ignored him, rigidly hunched and growling in the other direction. T-chan, Izuku asked, what's wrong? The green-haired teen wasn't expecting his answer to come in the form of a manhole cover blowing up right in front of them. In the blink of an eye, a large blob of sewage had oozed up and into the tunnel. Then a pair of eyes and jagged teeth floated up to the front of the blob, grinning nastily. A villain. A medium-sized invisibility cloak. The villain exclaimed as he loomed over the pair and his sister to boot. Before either Izuku or T could react, the globular villain had captured them both in tentacles of sludge. Don't worry little man, the villain cooed, smile growing beyond human limits. It'll only hurt for 45 seconds when I take your body. Then you'll feel good. Promise. A gelatinous eye swung from Izuku to a struggling T, who was hopelessly clawing at the tentacle wrapped around Izuku. The eye flowed from its original spot, down the tentacle holding the zombie girl, before trailing over every inch covered by the slimy appendage. MMM. Especially when I use you to rape this cute big sis of yours. With those parting words, the villain forced open Izuku's mouth and shoved a tentacle into the orifice. The moment the invading limb entered his mouth Izuku felt his trachea and esophagus collapse. He was glad for the automatic response, it would stop the villain from reaching his goal, but he was now in even more danger of asphyxiation. Fighting through the pain in his throat, the green-haired teen focused on finding an opening to give tea in order. Her superior strength was his only hope. Just a small chance. Gotta tell her. Aim for the eye. Izuku's thoughts became muddier as he struggled, the lack of air affecting him faster than he'd anticipated. Through his blurring vision, the besieged teen noticed that T was crouched, as if ready to jump. It wasn't a groan or a growl that ripped from T's lips as the zombie girl leapt through the air and clenched one of the sludge villain's eyes in her hand, it was a berserker's trumpet. Completely unbidden, the Ravenette had managed to capture one of their foe's weakest points. Sure enough, writhing in pain, the villain dropped Izuku. We need to, Izuku started to shout, cutting himself off to spit out the horrible taste in his mouth. T, run. Instead of running away, the zombie girl darted and dodged around the sludge villain's wild attacks as she ran to him. 
In seconds, the undead Ravenette had returned to Izuku's side. You, I quote, I'll kill you. The voice of the sludge villain modulated uncontrollably as his rage caused his body to lose cohesion. You will not touch them, boomed a powerful and manly voice from behind the villain. Why? Because I am here. The iconic words caused Izuku to freeze, his heart skipping a beat. It couldn't be. But the sight of a mountain of muscle bursting from the same hole the sludge villain had wiped away all doubt. It was his idol. All Might. In casual clothes. Texas S-M-A-S-S-S-S-S-H-H. All Might shouted, punching a fist in the direction of the villain. The insane amount of air pressure this caused forced a literal wall of wind to disperse the sludge villain, splattering him all along the walls. Pushed back as well, Izuku and T tumbled to the ground. In less than a minute, All Might zoomed through the scene, encapsulating the villain in a pair of plastic bottles. Taking a moment earned, he examined the two kids his own ineptitudes had almost caused harm. Judging from their sizes and dress, he guessed he'd just saved a middle schooler and his older sister. They had to have had some familial connection surely, both hadn't stopped checking over the other for injury since he'd arrived after all. He sort of worried for the girl though, she still appeared to be in a daze. Are you two all right? All Might asked, approaching the youngsters, I'm terribly sorry for not arriving sooner. It must have been a truly awful experience. He'd have to make it up to them somehow. An autograph never hurt right. All Might hoped it'd be that simple, he really had to leave as soon as possible. I'll be fine, Izuku waved off, seeming to forget whom he was speaking to while checking T for damage. I'm a regenerator after all. Then the green-haired teen's brain caught up with current events. Hey, all. All Might. In his shock, Izuku accidentally let go of T, who sunk down to the ground bonelessly, and dropped his backpack, spilling its contents all over the place. Sorry, sorry. Izuku quickly fell into a panic. He'd managed to not only drop poor T, who was obviously feeling the effects of low blood supply, but also spill his backpack everywhere and embarrass himself in front of the number one hero. Distracted as he was by helping T up, Izuku completely missed All Might snatching up a random notebook and signing the first pair of blank pages he could find. Here you go, citizen, All Might said, handing back the notebook while thinking of how to lie himself out of a no-doubt long-winded fan freakout. I hate to leave so soon, but I really must be getting this villain to the proper authorities. Wait. For a single moment, All Might paused. I need to ask you something, Izuku managed to start without stuttering. You see, I'm aiming for you and no time. The ever-smiling pro declared, beginning to leave. I hope to see you both as heroes in the future. With a single leaping step, the symbol of peace was gone. Izuku stood there, soggy from the excrement of the sludge villain and bruised all to hell, and felt more pain in his heart in that instant than he'd ever thought possible. He'd been dismissed. Just like that. His idol didn't even see him as worth a single conversation. I, I guess he was in a hurry. The words fell flat even to his own ears. Izuku knew the police station was in the opposite direction. Trying not to wallow in his self-pity, the green-haired teen finally set about gathering his things. I mean, he even signed my notebook upside down. Putting away the new memorabilia, Izuku shouldered his backpack without further thought. T, blank as ever, stepped up to his side. He didn't even notice you being. Izuku looked at the empty expression across his partner's face, her slight swaying as she stood waiting for him to do or say something. You, I, what do you think, T-Chan? Maybe for once his companion would offer him some advice. Or miraculously she could give a plausible explanation for why he was practically abandoned by his favorite hero. Really, he just needed to get rid of his dark thoughts. His bottled up emotional stress was no excuse to hate others. Hello. T's short groan put a small smile on Izuku's face. Not at all satisfied but accepting it was all he was going to get, the green-haired teen began the walk home. Yeah, well you stink too, Izuku replied in a lighter tone, come on. We've both gotta get a bath. Moans, groans, and grunts. While that was all he'd ever gotten from T, Izuku was pretty sure by this point he'd developed a pretty on-point feeling for the zombie girl's intentions. In any case, he made an effort just so he'd have some semblance of conversation. It kept away the loneliness somewhat. And definitely the bullies. And I've got to think of what to tell mom. A week later, the junkyard of Dagaba Municipal Beach Park. God fucking damn it. The roar of frustration was accompanied by the crash of a punch being slammed into a dryer. The clenched fist dented the metal skin of the machine, earning broken bones and bleeding wounds. Gritting his teeth through the pain, Izuku managed to lift the already mending hand to his partner's face. Slowly, T began to lick away any blood that had yet to fall. Over the months, the actions had become a sort of ritual for the green-haired boy and his zombie companion. Izuku's plan had been to finish middle school as a ghost. He'd keep quiet, garner no attention, and make it into UA with no past to haunt him. Although he'd made peace with the fact that Bakugo would also apply to UA, and with his quirk be a shoe in for acceptance, that hadn't meant they'd end up in the same class. Of course, like the piece of scum he'd long since proven himself to be, the homeroom teacher had ruined his efforts in moments by reading aloud his accepted application for entry to the prestigious high school. Why? Why did he have to overreact like that? Izuku asked the junk around him, why does he feel the need to push everyone else down, me down? 
Izuku's loud supplication ended and another broken fist lodged in the side of the dryer, this time followed by a larger indentation in the metal skin than before. Patiently, the detached tea lifted the newly wrecked limb and raised it to her lips. Gently, her discolored tongue darted out and licked away damage as it was found. The zombie girl's treatment continued until the hand was completely healed. In another life, another timeline, Izuku might have been a fearful kid, one prone to accepting the abuse dealt by those around him. But as the regenerator, as Romero, he'd long since been driven past the point of feeling fear. Or so he thought. He hadn't flinched when Bakugo, incensed by their teachers announcing his approved application, had savagely snapped at him. The blonde had spat out insults, declarations of being number one with no challengers, and stated how the green-haired teen had no choice but to give up and disappear. In the face of such treatment, Izuku had passed on watching and disappeared from his ex-childhood friend's warpath. None of it had fazed him after all. Nothing the blonde loudmouth could do to him, no amount of pain or degree of injury, could even slow him down for long. And death, that would only put a permanent stop to the exploding boy's dream, while Izuku would likely wake up a few minutes later completely fine. Back Hugo's response. The angry teen had pushed T out of one of the classroom's windows. From the third floor. That should have been me, not you T-chan, Izuku said, hugging the zombie girl. Laying her head on the green-haired teen's shoulder, T merely gave a soft moan. I still can't believe he only got a warning. In the face of the blonde once again getting off with a slap on the wrist, Izuku's reaction to the aggression had been explosive. None present had expected him to clock the bully in the face, leading to a broken and bleeding nose, before rushing out of the room to help the zombie girl. An hour later, the two had stood before the principal in moody silence. The sweaty, balding man had petitioned both teens to keep quiet about the altercation. No provable harm had come to Izuku and T, whose broken neck had already healed, while Bakugo risked seeing his future as a hero destroyed by a report of such murderous behavior. Apocalyptic in his seething rage, Izuku had threatened the coward in charge of his school with a lawsuit, dues for years of physical and psychological abuse just to start. In response, the principal had offered to expel Bakugo at the next sign of trouble. The bomber had nearly erupted at that, not seeing any reprehension in his actions. Needless to say, no one had left the office satisfied. Maybe, maybe I should use my quirk on him. Izuku pondered to himself, allowing a certain dark thought to surface. Maybe it had fixed that heart and brain of his. What do you think? That would be villainous. The unexpected male voice took the green-haired teen by surprise, causing him to yelp, while the ravenette beside him growled in warning. Having thought he was alone, Izuku wasn't prepared for the sight of his furtive observer when he turned around. Skeletal. That was the only way to describe the man before him. With eyes so sunken in their sockets they couldn't be easily seen and a lanky frame more skin and bone than muscle or fat, the visitor looked worse than half dead. The sad expression on the skeleton's face contrasted sharply with his vibrant, golden hair. I wasn't planning on committing a crime. Izuku shouted, grabbing T's wrist as a precaution. She hadn't lashed out at an innocent person yet, but it was his responsibility to make sure it never happened in the first place. I wasn't gonna hurt anyone. Well, using your quirk without a license, to beat someone up to boot, is a crime, quipped the young man, probably a year or two older than Izuku, as he came up to join the sickly adult. The new newcomer sported a rounded face, blue button-like eyes, neatly combed back gold hair, and a wide smile. Dot 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 even if the person deserves it. Young Tagata. You worded that wrong, the sickly older man mildly reprimanded. The boy, Tagata, hardly seemed too worried about it. Izuku looked between the two intruders who'd probably been spying on him for who knew how long, suddenly feeling self-conscious about letting out his inner grievances. This was all he needed right now, two complete strangers thinking he was planning on committing a crime. They'd no doubt call the police if he didn't try to clear the air. I think there's been some degree of confusion here, Izuku nervously started, inching away from the two blondes. With little effort, he managed to pull T along with him. I, I don't have a combative quirk. I find that hard to believe young man, the skeletal man retorted, raising a sharp brow. Besides, we aren't here to arrest you or anything. While glad to hear he wasn't facing imminent police action, Izuku was saddened to hear that once again an adult didn't believe him. Was there anyone besides T he could talk to in this world? Why don't you believe me? Izuku asked with a heavy sigh. A pair of fingers pointing behind him caused the green-haired teen to whip his head around. Oh, he supposed the sight of the manhandled dryer he'd been thrashing could be misleading. That's why, Izuku muttered. He guessed he'd been so focused on punching as hard as he could so he could actually feel something that he'd completely ignored the state of his target. Going by how the dryer was completely trashed now, he'd have to further explore this facet of himself before he hurt someone. So, what's your quirk? Tagata asked in clear, honest curiosity. To himself, the blonde young man entertained the idea of sparring with the green-haired boy. If it worked, it'd delay the insane workout his new coach had planned for him. For a little while, I'm just a regenerator, Izuku eventually said through his reluctance, earning further disbelieving stares from the pair. It wasn't exactly a lie. 
the Quirk Registry Association had accepted the change of his Quirk's name to Blood Repair, as that better reflected its abilities. But with the high possibility of more capabilities being discovered in the future, Izuku had decided to keep referring to himself as a simple regenerator. It might have been an oversimplification, but it was easier than the alternative. But, that would mean that you've been enduring the pain each of those impacts implies, the sickly man said, apparently concerned about Izuku's well-being. The green-haired teen had to admit, that would be a first. That must be quite the regenerative ability, Tagata added, taking a thinking pose. You've obviously been beating on this scrap for a while now. Breaking my hands or legs while training is nothing compared to some of the things I've had to endure, Izuku confessed, scratching the back of his head. His audience of two gaped in shock at his easy admittance, which was missed as the green-haired teen had turned his gaze to his feet. He'd never considered his quirk strong, not after failing to save the living tea back then. As for being strong, I hope so. I need to be strong to get accepted to UA this year. Shock morphed into appraisal, the blondes now examining the green-haired teen before them in a new light. Ah, uh, what's her deal? Tagata finally changed topics, bringing attention to the tall girl with a vacant expression that hadn't said a word yet. O.T. Chan, Izuku asked, she's not much of a talker. She's a fast healer too though. H-H-M-M-M-H. Izuku tried his best to hide a grin at T's grunt, earning confused glances and raised eyebrows in return. Fine. And she packs a mean bite, Izuku added, acting as if the ravenette had actually spoken instead of merely forced out a noise. Tagata opened his mouth, ostensibly to ask for clarification, when the sickly man coughed harshly. The distraction seemed enough to wipe the question from the younger man's mind as a new concern directed at the older man colored his expression. Shaking his head, the skeletal man waved the distress away. That makes sense, the thin man said, wiping something from his mouth. It's not unheard of for siblings to share close similarities in their quirks, especially mutant types like regenerators. Nodding his head, Izuku gladly passed off the man's assumptions for truth. If he could avoid explaining T's true nature and risk further ostracization then he would. That being said, the man continued, we actually came to train up young Tagata here. Would you care to join? Surprised by the offer, Izuku instantly fell into deep consideration. Are you sure coach? Tagata asked, smile blooming strong once more. Of course. The sickly man answered quickly. Too quickly apparently, as for some reason he seemed to force himself to calm down. I mean, yeah. A little friendly competition might push your limits you know. In the end, it didn't matter as Izuku had reached his own decision. Thank you for the offer, but I must decline, the green-haired teen said, sure in his words. I dream of being a commander, someone who guides others to victory and makes their jobs easier. I don't want to get in your way, and if All Might doesn't think I'm even worth his time, I know I'll just drag you two down as I am right now. Once again the blondes were speechless, each for their own reasons. Tagata was amazed by the kid before him, such determination and what were hallmarks for great hero potential. He couldn't wait to see the green teen at UA. The skeletal man, in contrast, was feeling his non-existent stomach sink into the ground. This was the kid he'd run into while catching that sludge villain, the one who'd been holding his own with his sister. He'd made an abrupt exit sure, but did he really leave the impression that All Might had thought he wasn't worth his time? Had he really screwed up so damn much? Thanks for the offer anyway, Izuku shouted as he began to leave the junk heap, pulling T behind him. I hope to see you again at UA. In silence, the two blondes watched as the two disappeared down the street. One was fired up, the other slipping into self-recrimination and guilt. What do you think, Yagi-sensei? Tagata asked with a hammy smile, hopeful that they'd just found a stroke of luck. Could he be another candidate? Unfortunately, the shaking head of vibrant golden hair wasn't the answer the smiling teen had hoped for. He has the right heart, sure. But, Yagi trailed off, choking on the truth he was realizing he might have had a hand in worsening. There's resentment in him too. We can't take the chance with him as he is at this moment. Nodding at his own words, sick as they made him, the skeletal man shifted to a heroic pose. Now, I'm giving you four months to clear this entire beach. Let's get to it. They'd lost enough time, it was time to see what his old sidekick's candidate could do. He was anxious to see if the kid was worthy of inheriting his quirk, and the responsibility that came with it. Four months later, UA. The large cement and glass behemoth that was UA loomed brightly in the light of day as Izuku and T walked up its steps. It was a day of days, the entrance exam was finally here. Scores of other hopefuls poured in from all sides, squeezing through the relatively small pair of double doors that stood as the final barrier to the prestigious academy's lobby. Izuku did his best to accept his nervousness and move past it, he couldn't afford to be a ghost anymore. His mother had once said, years ago, that being a hero required honesty, heart, and forwardness. He wouldn't let her down now. The green-haired teen swore to himself then and there, as he cleared the last steps up to the long common area that led to UAS front doors, that he'd shine. He'd shine, even if all others saw it in a sinister light. Well, we're finally here, Izuku muttered, getting a low grunt from his partner. It was an incredibly intimidating experience, being so close to one's dream. Out of the way, fucking Romero. 
In the span of seconds, Bakugo was there, as if there wasn't an entire open entryway he could have used instead. As the blonde passed, he roughly checked Izuku's shoulder, causing the green-haired boy to lose his balance, and fall forward face first. G-U-U-A-H-H. The scream came in a stereo of panic and distress. Izuku squeezed his eyes shut, hating that he'd be causing a scene before the first day. Unseen by him, T tried to lurch sideways in an attempt to catch him. Then, the falling abruptly stopped. Are you all right? Slowly, Izuku cracked open his eyes. Staring back at him was a cute brunette with rosy cheeks and innocent features, a gentle hand grasping his arm. He was. Floating. Yes. Izuku replied, piecing together what had happened. Thanks to you I think. As he floated, and holy shit he was weightless, T was quick to pull at Izuku until he was in an upright position. Sorry I didn't ask first, the brunette coyly murmured. But I just thought falling on the first day would be bad luck, you know. Even with his feet now on the ground thanks to T, Izuku realized he still wasn't able to keep his weight under him. The girl's quirk was incredibly strong. Why was that boy so rude to you Romero-san? The question, asked in ignorance and naivety, nonetheless caused a lance of pain to shoot through Izuku, easily showing on his face. I, I know it's not your fault, but, Izuku struggled with how to phrase what he needed to say. How did one explain a lifetime of bullying to a stranger? I'd be most grateful if you never say that name again. My name is Izuku Midoriya, and before you ask, Romero is that guy's way of insulting me. The green-haired teen hated the way the brunette flinched back, realizing she'd unintentionally offended the stranger she'd been trying to help out. He pushed on, hoping he could offer some small comfort. Don't feel bad about it, Izuku reassured, he's been doing it for a long time. I just hope Yue has ways to deal with people like him. It dawned on Izuku, as he finally relaxed from the adrenaline shot his impromptu fall and save had given him, that he was actually talking to a girl. Well, a girl that wasn't undead. Strangely, he couldn't seem to muster up the same icy fingers of panic he normally felt in such a situation. Still, I'm sorry, I didn't know, the girl insisted, a wavering smile equal parts apologetic and friendly on her face. Wordlessly, the brunette pressed her fingertips together, and Izuku felt the laws of gravity pass judgment on him once more. But, why Romero? Sounds like a nice foreign name to me. Izuku grit his teeth, really not wanting to explain. Still, hadn't he just been thinking about being more honest with others? Heroes didn't lie, no matter how they felt about the situation. Besides, the only friends worth making at UA would be those who could accept him regardless of his quirk anyway. Awkwardly, the green-haired teen pointed to the seemingly distracted Ravenette at his side. Him my quirk. Izuku stuttered, him makes. Zombies. It was always in the eyes. Initially there were looks of confusion, people never seemed to be able to compute the idea of real-life zombies. Then there was recognition, T's pallor, vacant expression, and red eyes were undeniable pieces of evidence for most. Then, panic often followed shortly after, skipping acceptance entirely. Panic. Just like that now filling the chocolate orbs of the now pale-faced brunette. Why you can't know what? The girl stammered, obviously leaning away from the reanimated corpse. I J just remembered I I have to T take an exam. Yes, are right now actually. Be by. Izuku had to admit, the brunette didn't run away screaming. She did power walk away faster than the green-haired teen had ever seen someone attempt before though. That went well. Izuku deadpanned, turning to his zombified companion. Think we'll ever be accepted without prejudice here. T groaned. You're right, Izuku agreed to the largely incoherent statement, there's no time to wax poetics, we've a test to ace. Let's go. Once more resolute in his purpose, Izuku and the zombie girl resumed their march toward the first obstacle to the green-haired teen's dream. Cursed Blood. Chapter 3. A Sinister Starting Line. The short trek to the specified auditorium from UAS front lawn had been an interesting experience for the boy with the cursed blood. Not a single inch of space throughout the hallways hadn't been covered in pictures of heroes, statues of the same post in every alcove, and awards and trophies packed into each display case. Honestly, it would have felt like visiting a museum had it not been for the staff, pro heroes no less, who'd been directing him and other hopefuls towards their destination. Izuku had initially been excited to see that the pro hero presiding over the exam would be none other than present Mike. After the flamboyant hero had braved an unresponsive audience, the green-haired teen was even more motivated to take the exam. Unfortunately, that enthusiasm had quickly died due to an unforeseen problem. Only a handful of minutes later, Izuku Midoriya had never considered himself to be a genius. In fact, he barely considered himself to be above average in the smarts department. He would admit, however, to being a nerd, one who liked studying, overthinking things, and acquiring knowledge on any topics that grabbed his interests. He rightfully attributed his often easily won perfect test scores to such characteristics. But as he sat there in his chair, T sitting next to him acting as a buffer against Bakugo's heated glare, Izuku looked at the test packet he'd been handed, and began to wonder, just where did the average person's intelligence lie? This is it. 100 questions, 25 mathematical inquiries, and 1 essay. Izuku thought in disbelief as he flipped through the pages. Had the rest of his exam fallen out by accident? Uncertain of how to proceed, the green-haired boy hesitantly raised his hand. 
Yes, examine 2234. Present Mike acknowledged with a resonant voice that easily filled the cavernous room of hopefuls. Do you need to feed that thing? It looked like the proctors for the exam had been forewarned about the undead that would be roaming the halls. And besides a raised brow, Izuku was glad to see the pro hero had no other reaction to T's presence. No, sir, I just wanted to make sure that the exam I received was complete, Izuku said, holding up the packet in question. Mine only has a hundred general knowledge and law questions, twenty-five low-difficulty mathematics problems, and an essay. It seems kind of short, and I'm worried that it's wrong somehow or a part fell out. The green-haired teen did not expect for the auditorium to explode with cries of despair at his words. Apparently the length of the exam, and the prospect of writing an essay, didn't sit well with some. That's all of it. Yes, present Mike confirmed before smirking devilishly, already finished. This was the pro's classic comeback for questions like this. There was one every year, a prospect that would be that guy, or girl, who believed themselves too smart for the written test. It never ruffled his feathers though, he'd always get to enjoy watching the smarty pants get destroyed during the practical. A taste of a real-world beatdown was so much more educational than a reprimand after all. Yes sir, I finished it, Izuku replied, face expressing how often he'd faced this sort of situation before. Shut up, no one wants to hear your shit, Bakugo violently shouted. Thankfully T's presence was enough to dissuade the blonde from a more physical response. Fucking Romero. Surprisingly enough to Izuku, the murmurings of agreement he'd come to expect following the bomber's words never came. Instead, the glares and stink eyes of disapproval usually sent his way were directed at his ex-childhood friend. Okay, okay, present Mike raised his voice, causing the more audio-inclined examinees to cringe. Put the packet face down and wait till time's up. Izuku did as directed as the pro went back to whatever it was he'd been doing to pass the time. Now faced with more free time than he'd expected to have, the green-haired teen decided to go over what he knew about the practical and analyze his battle tactics for any possible last-minute improvements. According to the little information provided, the second half of the exam consisted of a combat round. Examinees were to defeat robots with set-point values, ranging from 1 to 3, within a relatively short amount of time. Ignoring the zero-point obstacle, Izuku noticed a few glaring holes in the practical setup, the apparent absence of a score or penalty for property damage as well as no expectation of a search and rescue of civilians to name a few. It was almost as if Yue was focusing more on pure destructive power rather than capacity to help, weeding out those unsuited for direct combat, or were quirkless, before they even had a chance to prove themselves. It seemed like an incredible oversight on the administration's part. Two hours later, Battle Center B. Izuku and T found themselves mingling outside the entrance to the testing site, overshadowed by an enormous wall of cement and steel that almost boggled the mind. The green-haired T was currently drowning in tunnel vision. Student hopefuls from the same school had been separated, preventing easy cooperation, and they were about to face a massive simulated villain attack with complete strangers. While it seemed slightly unreasonable to Izuku, not having to worry about Bakugo and his attitude was a plus. I just don't get it. Why not simulate civilians too? Izuku's muttering continued, circling back to one of the two largest problems with the practical that he'd noticed. There's a lot of quirks that can only shine in search and rescue. Not all pro heroes are fighting machines. Too focused on his thoughts, the green-haired teen almost tripped over an inconspicuous cylindrical object. Luckily, T's arm shot out instantly, wrapping around him and keeping him upright. Whoa, oh, thanks T-chan, Izuku said, coming back to Earth with a shot of adrenaline. Hey, this isn't trash. Sure enough, the small object turned out to be a bottle of pills. The orange and green coloring implied medication, leading Izuku to read the bottle's label in case it was crucial for another examinee. And meclizine hydrochloride. These are nausea pills, Izuku realized, probably for motion sickness. Well, that doesn't sound too important for taking a test. Let's hand it over later. Pocketing the medication, the green-haired teen fully intended on trying to relax a little while he had time, T's sudden groan stopped him, catching his attention. What do you mean? It could be vital. Izuku asked the zombie girl. A blank stare from his undead partner made him huff in acceptance. Okay, you're right. If it could be, then we can't just leave it. Let's go ask if we can borrow a megaphone or something. Making haste, the two wove through the crowd in search of a staff member. As much as he hated being the center of attention Izuku knew T had been right, he would prefer a brief embarrassment caused by overworrying to the remorse of not helping someone in need. Unfortunately, with it getting closer to the time for the practical to begin, the crush of examinees made getting back to the edge of the crowd extremely difficult. In the past, middle school especially, T's presence had been enough to cause others to give Izuku a wide berth, but it seemed like UA hopefuls were made of sterner stuff. The green-haired team made a mental note to celebrate the possibility of making friends later. Finding that the crowd lessened in density the closer he got to the giant gated entrance for the testing site, Izuku made his way in that direction. Fearing he'd run out of time before the test began, the green-haired hero hopeful was beyond relieved when he finally sighted a suit-clad staff member. In a turn of uncharacteristically good coincidence, the pretty brunette who'd saved him from falling earlier was standing just off to the side of the adult. Hopefully after completing his good deed he'd have a chance to make a proper introduction. Where do you think you're going? 
A firm voice asked as Izuku felt a large hand grasp his shoulder. Turning around, the green-haired teen came face to face with the examinee who'd asked present my questions about the exam they were about to take. The teen was quite imposing, as tall as T with sharp, focused eyes made doubly so by the angular glasses he wore. The stern frown didn't help either. Aye aye, I just need to give us something. Between his tongue being tied due to his lack of a social life and having to grab T's hand to keep her from lashing out, Izuku's explanation lost too much steam to be decipherable. You're the one who attempted to demoralize the other examinees by revealing the length of the written exam, and that you'd already finished it, aren't you? The imposing boy's severe expression grew suspicious, earning a growl from T. Were you going to try and distract that girl next? Izuku was beyond confused now. While he might have been used to facing accusations in the past, usually being spooky due to having a zombie trailing behind him all the time, this was the first time he'd ever been charged with attempted sabotage. The automatic responses he'd developed over the years died on the tip of his tongue. Demora, W what are you talking about? The green-haired teen was at a loss. Now that I think on it, something about you doesn't add up. The bespectacled boy plowed on, ignoring Izuku's question. Finishing the written exam so quickly would suggest you hold an intelligence-boosting quirk, yet you strut around with this girl as if she's under a pet-controlling quirk. Izuku didn't know whether to be flattered that a complete stranger equated his academic prowess to someone with superhuman intellect or overly nervous that said stranger had almost guessed an aspect of his quirk so easily. He really needed to put more effort into teaching T how to appear human apparently. Uh huh. Izuku's interrogator shouted, one arm chopping the air repeatedly. You must be a higher-year student sent by the staff to cull applicants who are easily distracted or frightened by adversity. As expected of UA, the tall boy continued droning on, arm chopping all the while. Izuku felt a headache coming on from the stranger's extreme case of tunnel vision. Please tell me I'm not that bad when I go into muttering mode, Izuku asked T, who'd calmed down when the newcomer hadn't made any threatening movements towards him. The zombie girl gave a soft groan in response, which was almost missed under the murmur of the stranger. God, fucking damn it. Izuku finally snapped, could you please stop so I can go report this lost medication to the staff. It wasn't quite a shout, but the green-haired teen's urgency and seriousness were clear. Snapping out of his monologuing, the strange, glasses-wearing boy stepped aside. For some unfathomable reason, he looked put out. Finally free, Izuku went to resume his tasks. Start. With speed belied by its size, the massive gate for the testing site opened. A pregnant silence settled over the gathered examinees, many looking about unsure of what had just happened. Izuku himself had a sinking feeling. Already in motion he began to inch away from his targeted staff member and instead turned toward the now open gateway. What are you waiting for? There's no countdowns in real life. That was the only warning present Mike gave before the veritable horde of applicants charged forward. Not even a minute into it, and Izuku already felt the test had devolved into madness. Not a proper assessment of hero material at all. Five minutes or halfway through the practical. Izuku had never been a fan of destruction. In fact, he loathed even the idea of causing property damage. When it had become clear to him that he'd never be like All Might, he'd begun studying other, less extreme, heroes with the same fervor he'd once reserved for the number one. His analytical mind had quickly zeroed in on key differences in how missions, operations, and even safety protocols were carried out between the two. Almost to a T, the more combat-oriented, powerful heroes had the harsher time of it in the aftermaths of major battles or operations. There were always a number of complaints about property damage that would follow in their wake, as in the case of Endeavor, or even environmental concerns as was the case whenever Crust was involved. In contrast, while pros with less destructive, more specialized quirks might suffer more during the course of their missions, they were rarely taken to task afterwards. Doors and windows were easier to replace than railways and skyscrapers after all. Call it selfish, call it considerate, but Izuku had decided the less problems his heroing caused the better. This decision was why he'd changed his mindset concerning how to approach missions. Brains over brawn, it was a cliché to be sure, but one that suited him just fine. His mother still worried about him developing OCD however. T. Restrain. Izuku shouted, dodging a wide swipe from a one-pointer robot. The zombie girl slammed into the attacking machine, quickly attempting a grapple that pit her superior strength against its flailing limbs. Undead muscle strained against advanced hydraulics, not enough to pile on damage, but that was the point. The green-haired teen didn't want to rip the one-pointer's head off. Uh huh, that's twenty. Izuku cheered as he punched the off switch located on the back of the foe villain. It had actually surprised the green-haired teen at the start, upon engaging the robots, he'd been able to analyze their design and quickly realize that a multitude of different quirk types could easily exploit a number of obvious flaws. While destructive quirks could just destroy the robots with their lightly armored bodies, quirks leaning toward agility, speed, or stealth could take advantage of the conveniently placed off switch on their backs. For a more eclectic option, a technopathic or polarity quirk would have easily allowed a user access to the robot's rubber bullet turrets or low-yield rocket launchers. How are you holding up T-Chan? Izuku asked as he took a moment to take a quick rest. In the short time since the practical had begun, he'd taken a fair few hits, lucky robots that managed to break free from T's hold, and a few hopefuls that had been less than mindful of their quirk use, causing debris to fly at him. 
Nothing so far had been close to lethal even for a normal human, but his regeneration was beginning to cause hunger pangs. Thrrrr. The zombie girl's groan sounded pained, which only ever happened when her blood supply ran low. Izuku realized he had two options. Refuel tea and stop hunting robots, or push on and hope that his partner could power through her debilitating rigor mortis. The dilemma reminded Izuku of something his mother had once told him when he'd first openly accepted he'd never be a super powerful hero like All Might. He told her that working with T had given him insight on how commanding others could still allow him to help save people and guide others to greater successes. In response, Inko had likened him to a surgeon, his future subordinates and or co-workers his tools. He'd loved the analogy and had quickly told T that she was his first scalpel. And as he stood there in a simulated war zone, he realized. A good doctor never let his tools become dull. That bad, huh? A rhetorical question to be sure. Izuku detached the one-pointer's gun arm hastily, finding the trigger made for human hands a hilarious feature. Okay then. I've got this now, so let's just focus on staying out of trouble for a bit and get you back up to snuff. We've got to be mindful of our limits. While seamlessly working with T against the machines, in the midst of the chaos of the exam, Izuku recognized he'd had an epiphany. He still wanted to be a hero, to save everyone he could, but where once he'd dreamed of jumping into the fire to save lives, he now understood he really could guide others into avoiding said fire while still saving everyone. His dream was a real possibility, that had lessened his concern about the practical to an extent, any number of points would help him move toward his goal. If he got into the hero course, or even the support course, great, but missing those high marks wasn't the end of the world. Aiming high was important, but failing the UA entrance exam only meant he'd have to look elsewhere. There would always be other schools after all. Hell, as battle-oriented as the practical turned out to be, maybe he'd take a look at Shikesu anyway. Less than five minutes left, Izuku announced, giving T an honest smile. This was a wild ride, huh? I think we might actually have a small chance for the hero course you know. And if not, 20's gotta be enough for support. Loosening his hold on the appropriated gun arm, Izuku almost dropped it when a sudden tremor hit the testing ground. Thrust back into high alert, the green-haired teen scanned the area for threats. Behind him, T let out a growl. Turning, Izuku saw the zombie girl was facing the center of the testing site. And the massive robot that now towered over the entire skyline with ease. With enormous arms and a cannon-like head with eight glowing eye lenses, it was clear the final faux villain was a real heavy hitter. Thankfully, it didn't seem to have legs, only treads attached to the bottom of its torso, so its maximum speed wouldn't be too fast. Even so, all of the examinees in its vicinity immediately began to run away in fear. Sensing the motion below, the zero-pointer raised a massive fist and punched the street. Like a bomb going off the colossal attack unleashed a devastating shockwave, sending a plume of dust through the streets and raining a cloud of debris down on fleeing hopefuls. Izuku looked at the giant robot with a critical stare. Present Mike had said to avoid it, that it would only attack when near examinees. But that hadn't been the case. So what was its true purpose then? Or was it defective? It would require a tremendous effort by a group of coordinated combat quirk users to even put a dent in it, and there was no telling the amount of injuries that could occur if they tried taking it down. And should they succeed in the end? Zero points for the trouble. With these factors in mind, Izuku decided that sticking around wasn't the smart thing to do. So, set on leaving, the green-haired teen turned away from the titanic robot. It looked like this was the end of the line for him. Help. The voice was faint, but even amidst the chaos it carried. Mature dream or not, Izuku would never be able to ignore a cry for help. In an instant he'd stopped his retreat and gazed out in the direction of the call. To his horror, his eyes fell upon the cute brunette who'd helped him with her quirk earlier. She'd been trapped under a chunk of debris. Her face was screwed with pain and the wreckage pinning her from the waist down was surely the cause. The worst part, she didn't appear able to escape. Please, help me. The plea, followed by a hand extending blindly outward in desperate supplication, spurred the green-haired teen into action. Only the most cold-hearted of bastards would have refused such a call, fear of being crushed to death under the thumb of a rampaging robot notwithstanding. Now, Izuku Midoriya was by no means an abnormally strong teen by hero society, nor exceptionally fast or agile. In fact, only hours ago, he wouldn't have labeled his own intelligence as anything special, though now he was beginning to suspect. But for all his shortcomings, there was one aspect of the green-haired teen that outshone all those around him. And as they watched from their darkened control room as he ran towards the trapped girl without hesitation, the observing future teachers of UAS newest hero hopefuls were given a front-row seat to this shining quality. Izuku Midoriya had the heart of a true hero. T. Rescue and retreat. Izuku shouted, calling out a basic strategy on the fly. I'll distract it. It was a risky plan, and he knew he'd never be able to defeat the Zero Pointer on his own, but if he could save the girl that was all that mattered. Look at me you glorified trash can. Perhaps not the most imaginative of taunts, but combined with shooting an entire clip of rubber bullets at the robot's eye lenses, it did the trick. Even though not a shot landed, the dual annoyances managed to grab the attention of the advancing machine. 
Meanwhile, the trapped brunette watched as the green-haired boy she'd fled from earlier ran headfirst into danger. Shame clutched at her heart, she'd been so rude before and here he was putting his life on the line to save her. Suddenly, the weight that had been a crushing presence on her lower body disappeared. Looking down, the girl noticed the zombie girl was straining to lift the masonry that had pinned her down. Not wasting a moment, she crawled free. Before the brunette could fully stand, her ankle burned something fierce, and flee on her own she felt herself lifted and slung across a slim pair of shoulders like a sack of potatoes. Craning her neck, the girl found that it was again the zombie girl, this time carrying her away from the danger. Moving too jarringly to speak, the girl instead chanced to watch the green-haired teen dip and dodge attacks like a badass character out of a video game. Yes, T-Chan did it. Izuku murmured through clenched teeth, taking a second to look at the retreating girls. Now I can get away. Unfortunately, the green-haired teen had just made a classic rookie mistake. As soon as he took his eyes off the zero-pointer, the robot managed to land a bone-shattering punch on him. The sheer force of the blow sent Izuku shooting away, a green blur in the air. Izuku's scream followed him as he sailed through the air like a rocket. The pain was astronomical, but the worst part was he could already feel his shattered bones and pulverized muscles stitching themselves back together. Landing was going to be a bitch, he could already tell his body would break all over again at this rate. Just as he soared over T's head, Izuku felt the brunette, who'd been laid over the zombie girl's shoulder, reach out and catch his cheek with the whole of her hand. There was the clear sound of a snap, and the pilfered one-pointer gun dropped to the ground with a clatter. Izuku's body slowed to a halt mid-flight, hanging in the air like a puppet with its strings cut. Our release, the brunette said, steepling her fingers so the pads touched. Suddenly with no warning, the zombie girl sat her on the ground, just as Izuku dropped to the street like a rock. The green-haired teen didn't move a muscle. Fearing for his health, the girl rushed over to see what the problem was, and immediately wished she hadn't. Izuku's neck had been twisted around completely 180 degrees. The brunette could hardly hold down her already roiling stomach at the sight, until a horrible realization hit her like a freight train, she just accidentally killed her savior by trying to slow his fall. The potent mix of nausea and horror was too much. Collapsing, the girl began to vomit everything left in her abused stomach. Crack, whipping her head up at the abrupt noise, the brunette tried to pinpoint the source of the progressively louder sounds of cracking and popping to their source. It almost sounded like bones being forcibly snapped back into position. That hurts a lot. The voice of her apparently not dead savior sent the girl reeling in frightened shock. Looking down, she witnessed the exact moment Izuku raised his hands and wrenched his head back into place. In moments, the ugly bruising that had been spreading around his neck faded too. Big, sweet, clear green eyes that couldn't belong to such an undying monster turned to look up at her. Are you alright? Izuku asked the brunette as soon as he'd gotten his wits back. Does anything hurt? Officially beyond anything she'd been prepared to handle, the girl gave the only answer she could, she rolled her eyes to the back of her head and fell unconscious. She'd deal with reality when it made sense again. Izuku looked to T for an answer to what just happened. Helpfully, the zombie girl stared back, as blank as ever. The green-haired teen shrugged. Well, at least she didn't fall in her own vomit. Knowing he and his companion were at their limit, Izuku moved to prepare to haul the brunette onto his back. Let's get her out of here before the giant trash can. In that's time, saved by present Mike's announcement, every examinee still conscious let out an explosive sighs of relief. That was convenient. Izuku sighed along, glad he only had to position the girl away from her vomit now. In no time at all, an extremely short, elderly woman appeared at the testing site. Decked out in a hospital-themed motif, it was immediately clear to Izuku that Recovery Girl, a heroine long famous for her healing quirk, had arrived. While the green-haired teen gushed and debated on whether or not to beg the legendary pro for an autograph, the youthful heroine went about and checked the student hopefuls for injuries. Unnoticed in the background, an imposing boy wearing glasses couldn't help the feelings of failure that were striking at his heart. He couldn't ignore the truth of what he'd just witnessed. When the situation had called for a hero, only one small boy had stood up and faced the challenge. None of the others had seen it, being too focused on escaping like he'd almost been, but the green-haired stranger he'd confronted earlier had braved a danger completely out of their league without question. As soon as he'd seen the trapped girl, he'd moved. Due to his gathered points, the boy knew he'd most likely be accepted into UA. But now, he hoped the other boy did as well. He was someone worthy of calling a classmate. One week later, the days after the entrance exam, while waiting for UAS answer, passed for Izuku much like his previous months of training had, he enjoyed his mother's large home-cooked meals, taught tea new tricks, and otherwise made himself useful. While his mother hadn't said it, he knew she'd been worried at first, hoping he wouldn't be disappointed. Letting her know he was only waiting to hear back which class would accept him, not if he had been accepted, allowed her to relax somewhat. Now and Co loved her son, that was plain to see, but it pained her to know that for all of his quirks abilities her baby wasn't immune to the pain he faced. Her son's extraordinary endurance and ability to survive meant little to her when she knew he suffered through each ordeal he went through twice, once from the wounds when they were inflicted and once from the healing process that fixed them. 
Like any good mother, she wanted her son to reach his dream, but she feared it just the same. Heroes always ended up hurt in the end. That's why, in the darkest corner of her heart, Inko secretly prayed that Izuku would only get into the support course. Or even better, general studies. Izuku, male, Inko called out as soon as she picked up the day's post and saw a letter that revealed it held UAS seal. So today was the day her son had been waiting for. No matter what happened next, she swore she'd support him no matter what. Finally, Izuku shouted, sliding into the living room from the hallway. Now let's see which class it's gonna be. Inko smiled as she watched her son enter his focused stance, eyes glued to his letter. He neatly opened the little piece of cardstock, obviously wanting to keep it intact as a memento, and pulled out what was inside. In the palm of his hand sat a small metal disc, no bigger than a cup lid. Without warning a hologram burst to life from the disc, causing Izuku to drop it on the table in shock. I am here, as a projection. The booming voice of All Might filled the entire apartment, the top pro's imposing image not diminished in the least by his questionably fashionable yellow suit. Surprised into speechlessness mother and son collapsed onto the family couch to listen to the symbol of peace's message. Having taken her time, T slowly made her way from Izuku's room and stood behind the two. Actually, I came here to work at UA. All Might continued, slightly more controlled. Now then, Izuku Midoriya. While you scored a miraculous perfect score on the written exam, 20 points in the practical just isn't enough to warrant a place in the hero course. Instead of feeling much disappointment, Izuku took the news with a shrug, earning a discreet sigh of relief from his mother. Leaning in, the green-haired teen locked his gaze on the hologram, he still needed to know if he'd made it into the support course. At least if that was all there was to it. All Might's words caught the two living audience members by surprise once again, especially with how cheeky the hero sounded. T, unseen behind them, cocked her head to the side. Your actions spoke louder than any words ever could. Look here. All Might spun around, pointing a remote to a floating screen in the hologram. In the display, footage of Izuku's bravery ran from multiple angles. Hugh, who had no combat ability, showed more courage than a thousand lions. And Ko couldn't feel her hands. Before her eyes, her baby was taking the role of an ant against an elephant, all to save a stranger in need. Was the room spinning? How could any hero course reject? No. Not beg for you to accept. All Might shouted, open fist clenching in a dramatic pose. Heroes are meant to risk their lives to save others whenever the need arises, not for money or glory, but because it's the right thing to do. Caught in his own emotional appeal, All Might slammed his hands down and leaned into the camera, his electric blue eyes glowing under the shadow of his heavy brows. This is why examinees weren't informed about them. But in addition to villain points, the exam awarded rescue points. Rearing back, All Might waved to a scoring board, which was soon cut to fill the whole screen. Scanning the information quickly, Izuku found his slot. The line contained his name, villain points, and the newly flashing rescue points, 60. Yes indeed, you passed with flying colors. All Might announced, the camera cutting back to the larger-than-life hero. So come, young Midoriya, this is your hero academia. The dramatic welcome filled Izuku with elation, along with a small bit of guilt at judging the best academy in eastern Japan ahead of time. Suddenly, the smiling image of All Might was disrupted by a holographic arm, which passed him a piece of paper. Quickly scanning the note's contents, the confused expression on the pro's face was clear to see. Izuku Midorianti, All Might asked, scratching the back of his head. Wait, this says she's a zombie. Didn't he call her his sist? As quickly as it had started the holo disc cut off, All Might's puzzled expression a last, unintended blooper. Izuku picked up the unexpected means of acceptance, his own puzzlement clear. I don't remember ever telling All Might T was my sister. In fact, I've only said that to a handful of people. Expecting the look demanding explanation, Izuku slapped a palm onto his forehead. Don't judge me mom. You don't know how hard it is. Izuku's defensive rant died at the sight of his mother, unconsciously lying on the couch. The footage of his fight with the zero pointer must have been too much for her all at once. I'm so grounded this weekend. Izuku said as he softly smiled at the woman who'd always supported him, knowing in advance that no amount of apologies were going to be enough to erase her newest traumas. At least she probably didn't see the part where the giant robot had clocked him with that mean punch. Or his interaction with the brunette afterwards. I guess I'll have to design us some hero costumes now. Izuku muttered, realizing his achievement came with some mandatory pre-semester requirements. What do you want T? The zombie girl, who he'd eventually noticed, had been oddly attentive throughout the holographic acceptance letter. Leaning down, T effortlessly picked and co-op into a fireman's carry. Executing an old half-order Izuku had once given her to always help his mother to bed if she ended up falling asleep early for some reason. Pausing, T turned to Izuku and groaned, Of course I'm not going to dress you up in a skin-tight suit. Izuku said, false offense heavy in his voice. Don't worry about it, I'll think of something good. It might have just been his idea of playful banter, but Izuku knew he needed to put real effort into these costumes. They had to be good, not only for his and T's safety, but to show how serious he was in becoming a hero. It wouldn't hurt if they also reassured his mother they weren't jumping head first into harm's way and prepared to. One month later, first day of class at UA. After a month away, Izuku and T were able to find their way through the halls of UA surprisingly easily. 
Like many other high schools that boasted multi-story buildings nowadays, the first floor was where all of the first year's classes would be, so it only took one flight of stairs to generally be in the right place. After that it was only a matter of walking the halls until they found where 1A, the duo's assigned class, was located. Luckily for them, they'd left early so getting a little lost along the way wouldn't be a problem, and the stairwell was only a handful of doors away from their destination. After getting over how over the top the door to the room was, Izuku and T were ready for the first day of class. With each step, the green-haired teen dreaded how much of a disaster it would likely become. He well knew there was no point in bragging about points or deeds. The exam was only meant to indicate one's level of deservedness of having a place at the academy after all, not keeping it. And with his quirk, introductions were always a crapshoot. Izuku's first day of middle school came to mind. Just as he put his hand out to grab the door, Izuku saw the cute brunette from the exam out of the corner of his eye. She looked back at him and waved with a smile. You're the guy that saved me. The girl greeted with an energy and cheerfulness the green-haired teen hadn't been expecting. You were like a total badass and everything. Much too quickly for Izuku's comfort, the brunette had closed the distance between them. She didn't invade his personal space, but he still felt his mind start to fritz at their proximity. I, I, I can hardly say that. Izuku pushed out through his nervousness, I still, still couldn't dodge that last punch. Over the years, Izuku had practiced his speaking by talking to T, allowing him to greatly reduce his stuttering. However, that did little to nothing to get rid of his awkwardness around live people. Oh, yeah, sorry you got hurt saving me. The girl's cheerfulness died at the still fresh memory, the crushing guilt, the cracking of bones. If only I hadn't lost my medication. Wait, is this yours? Izuku asked suddenly, slinging off his backpack. He dug around inside before pulling out the bottle of pills he'd found before the practical exam. The brunette's chocolate eyes blew wide open. Oh, what? Where did you find it? The girl was beside herself as she took the medicine, alternating between glancing at the label and the boy before her. I kinda almost tripped over it right before the exam, Izuku explained, scratching his head with an awkward smile. I meant to hand it over to a staff member but I got distracted. Phew. It was so quiet he almost missed it. Looking down, Izuku saw the brunette was slightly shaking. She was, starting to tear up. First you saved my life, and now you return my medication. The girl seemed on the edge of a breakdown the more she spoke. And all I did, even now. And just like that, Izuku understood. It hadn't taken him long to realize the brunette was most likely a naturally energetic and friendly person, the kind that jumped all over you to say hello and ask you if you were as happy as they were. But, like she tried to explain, she was keeping her distance from him instead of doing all that. He could see the guilt in her eyes, as well as the darting looks she sent T. It doesn't matter. Blurting things out was one way to defuse a situation Izuku supposed. T added a grunt for good measure. W what? The girl started at the shout, her confusion and surprise enough to disrupt her emotional upheaval. Izuku shook his head, letting out a weak smile. Zombies are unnerving, I know that, and T-chan's a zombie, Izuku explained. You're just having a natural, instinctual reaction. I won't hold it against anyone for experiencing something as universal as the fear of the unknown and bizarre. Rubbing her eyes clear, the brunette swallowed down her troubled thoughts. She smiled back at Izuku, which the green-haired student took as a good sign. As your classmate though, I hope I'll be able to prove to you that she's just a part of my quirk. I also hope you come to accept that she's just as reliable as I am, Izuku continued eloquently. Why don't we start again? The brunette nodded quickly, visibly relieved that she hadn't ruined a potential friendship. Hello, my name is Izuku Midoriya and I'll be attending Class 1A. It's nice to meet you. To cap his speech, Izuku gave a courteous bow. He hoped it was obvious that he was more than willing to forgive and forget whatever insult the girl had imagined she'd given. Her beaming smile hinted that he might have been at least a little successful. Hello to you. My name is Achako Yuraka. Achako began her own introduction, returning the polite bow. I'll be attending class when I hear. It's nice to meet you too. It was surprising how much better clearing the air made the girl feel. She didn't have to worry she was insulting her savior anymore. A sudden groan from T grabbed Achako's attention, although it was immediately stolen by Izuku's response to the zombie girl. You're right, we should probably enter now and meet the rest of our classmates. As if understanding the undead was an everyday thing for him, Izuku once again reached out to open the door to the classroom. Meanwhile, Achako stood wide-eyed at the display. D, did you just understand what she said? Achako asked in alarm. How did you do that? Unfortunately, the answer to these questions would have to wait. As soon as he'd opened the door, Izuku, T, and Achako herself were caught up in the chaos that was Class 1A. The most eye-catching for the newcomers was the tall, bespectacled student with the overly imposing facial expression. From desk to desk the teen ran around the room, chopping his arms through the air as he preached his idea of order to anyone who'd listen which wasn't many. Izuku glanced around, noticing a shorter girl, for once giving him the height advantage with someone, with frog-like features sitting three desks back from the door, silently eyeballing everyone as well. 
Somehow, she made holding a finger up to her mouth in consideration look cute, leaning diagonally backwards from the desk in front of the froggy girl, excitedly making conversation with a floating girl's uniform was a pink-skinned girl with wild hair like Izuku's and two curled horns. The green-haired teen got the impression that she'd either eaten a ton of sugar for breakfast or just had more energy than she knew what to do with. A boy with blood-red hair and shark-like teeth was switching between keeping an eye on the pink girl and yelling about manliness to a bored-looking girl with bizarre ears who could have been the poster child for punk rock. The crimson shark boy didn't seem to be offended that the girl was mostly ignoring him. Like a sixth sense, Izuku avoided looking at the far wall, where a familiar blonde was burning holes into anyone who'd make eye contact with him. Hey you, the imposing teen called out as he marched toward the door. Seeing as he was marching in his direction, Izuku pointed a finger at himself. He had no idea what this guy could want with him. Yes, you. I owe you an apology. Izuku was too shocked to respond before the imposing teen had pushed on, arms still chopping. During the exam I was rude to you, accusing you of being a fake student or someone unfit for the hero course. But, you were the only one who noticed the true intent of the exam. You not only more than earned your place here, but proved me wrong at every level. The imposing guy shifted to a more humbled demeanor as he spoke, allowing Izuku to slightly relax himself. Able to concentrate now, the green-haired teen quickly recognized who the student before him was, the examinee that had accosted him and forced him to miss his chance to hand over Achako's medication. First of all, there wasn't some hidden facet to the exam to notice. I just did what was right, at least in my heart, Izuku explained, shaking his head. Gesturing to the rosy-cheeked girl beside him, he smoothly transitioned attention away from himself. And second, don't apologize to me, apologize to her. The medication you stopped me from delivering to the staff. It was hers. The no longer imposing teen descended into a flurry of apologies to the now giggling Achako, all the while waving his arms in an overly dramatic fashion. The scene earned a warm smile from the boy with the cursed blood. For the first time he was meeting people who were nice to him without any ulterior motives. If he could meet even one more person like the two before him now, he'd be happy. Go somewhere else if you want to play friends. A tired and gravely voice scolded, catching the teens off guard. Looking around, then down, the three found. A man in a sleeping bag. Faster than someone wrapped up should be able to move, the man stood up and emerged from his toasty cocoon. Looking around the room with obvious disdain, he shuffled to the teacher's desk. Beaten down look notwithstanding, the man's very presence left quite the impression on the students. I'm your homeroom teacher, shout Aizawa, the now named Aizawa announced, digging into his sleeping bag. Finding what he'd been looking for, he stood up, now holding a wad of UA gym uniforms. This may seem sudden, but change into these and meet me at the athletics field. You have ten minutes. As Peace said, the gruff teacher left without another word, leaving confused students in his wake. Eleven minutes later, twenty students and one zombie stood together at UAS Athletics Field, the living of the group staring with no little surprise and fear at their teacher. he just announced that he was going to test their potential through physical tests, which they'd expected, while allowing them to use their quirks, which hadn't been but was enthusiastically welcomed. And then Mina Ashido had mentioned fun. If you think life here at UA is going to be all about fun, how about this? Aizawa had growled, glaring at the students, the one who scores lowest will face immediate expulsion. Oddly enough, there hadn't been any frightened pleas for fairness or something silly like that. It was apparent that all present had already accepted that UAS beyond, plus Ultra would throw extreme curveballs at them from day one. Now they were up to bat. The entrance exam was designed to identify those with the minimum required skills to enter this academy. Aizawa continued on, ignoring the now-drawn faces of the teenagers lined up in front of him. Now it's up to me to ascertain if any of you have the potential to become real heroes. And we're going to start with this. From his pockets, Aizawa withdrew a simple-looking ball and his smartphone, which was open to an app with multiple challenges listed. Throwing a ball. If they'd been able to move a muscle, half of one would have collapsed in disbelief. Seeming to know what his potential students were thinking, the gruff teacher sighed at their ignorance. Your objective is for the ball to reach the furthest point possible. As long as you don't leave the circle here, you may use any means necessary, Aizawa explained. And yes, I'm serious about using your quirks. You're no longer bound by illogical middle school rules. Act like it. At this point, some of one had thawed from the chilling fear expulsion had shot into their veins. Looks of determination and grit began to enter the eyes of a number of the heroes in training. Belief in their abilities, belief in all of the hard work they'd put themselves through to get to this point, was lighting a fire in them. Now, the examinee who achieved the highest score in the practical exam will be our guinea pig, and go first, Aizawa announced. That Hugo, having largely been unaffected by the words spoken so far, smirked at this. Sure in his superiority, he began to step forward. Izuku Midoriya, you better set a good example of how to maximize the use of one's quirk. That Hugo stopped dead in his tracks as Aizawa motioned for Izuku to take the ball and step up to circle. The blonde glowered at the green-haired teen in absolute hatred. 
Of course, sir, Izuku replied, palming the ball and taking his place. T, whose green tracksuit contrasted heavily with the sea of blue surrounding her, followed closely. In middle school, Izuku knew he'd never surpassed 30 meters on a ball throw, never even close. But now, now he could use his quirk as he believed it had been intended. Standing firmly, he raised the ball up and, T-chan, please take this ball and place it at 1,000 meters exactly, gave an order. Dropping the ball into awaiting hands, the green-haired teen and his bewildered teacher and fellow students watched as the undead girl began to jog away. Soon enough, the group of onlookers watched as the zombie girl elegantly bent down and delicately placed the ball on the ground. In much less time than it had taken to carry out the order, T returned to her original position. Coming up to Izuku, it was clear she was waiting for another order. Exactly 1,000 meters, Aizawa stated, not bad. Showing his phone's display to the class, the gruff teacher revealed the level of precision used and how high the bar had been set. Cries of disbelief ran amok, more than once accompanied by calls of unfairness. They were summarily ignored. Bakugo reacted to it all the worst. The blonde was seeing red. As Izuku gave T her head pats, something he liked to think the zombie girl enjoyed, he couldn't help but feel blessed that for the first time, he found himself in a place that allowed him to be himself. He'd found nice people, a teacher that wasn't going to push him down, and was encouraged to use his quirk. He swore to himself then and there, he'd work harder than ever to convince everyone that his power had the potential to be used for the good of the people. But for the moment, he felt comfortable with his starting line. Cursed Blood. Chapter 4. A Sinister Friendship. Shout Aizawa, pro hero codename Eraserhead, eyed his newest batch of wannabe students with some reservation. They might have taken his threat of expulsion better than some of their predecessors, but he still fully intended to discern their individual potentials. If they had any. One of the reasons he even bothered teaching at UA was because it gave him the perfect justification to seek out and prevent future disasters from happening. People with quirks they didn't understand or didn't care to control often ended up at the academy for one reason or another. Spotting these kinds of brats so that they could be handled properly away from the delicate public was worth his time. When he'd been assigned 1A, again. He'd done his usual research into the incoming students' files and found a few that had caught his eye. One, in particular, stood out for a variety of reasons. Izuku Midoriya, the boy with a troubled past. The kid lacked a true understanding of his quirk, made use of a reanimated corpse he'd watched killed in front of him, and while clearly some finer details had been left out, spent most of his school career as a lone wolf. While the practical exam had revealed his budding heroic heart, the unknown limits of the teen's zombification abilities worried him. A history of suspected, bullying, isolation, and trauma only increased the risks of villainous potential. Return to your spot, Midoriya, Aizawa said, shaking himself from this thoughts. And remember, keep your pet under control. Or, failing that, be quick to warn me if your control slips. The grizzled pro's sharp eyes caught the grinding of the green-haired teen's teeth at the referral of the reanimated corpse as a pet. He added a mental note to Midoriya's file that his relationship with the undead girl was viewed as more meaningful than previously recorded. Thankfully, after a firm nod, the boy went to join the rest of his classmates. Out of the corner of his eye, Aizawa suddenly noticed the movements of a spiky blonde. He wasn't anywhere near naive enough to believe the scowling boy wanted to give his classmate a friendly handshake. Fucking Romero, I'm going to. Bakugo's rage sputtered out before it could really ignite. Nothing had happened. He was pointing an open palm at the freak but nothing was happening. What the foo, the spiky blonde's cursing was cut off his bandage like cloth abruptly wrapped around him. No matter how much he struggled, the cloth held and he couldn't break free. In fact, the more he struggled the more tangled he became. And what exactly were you trying to do? Aizawa growled lowly, a hint of real anger crossing his expressionless face. Attacking or harming a fellow student or member of the staff outside of training exercises is grounds for immediate expulsion. Those currently not tied up like a mummy watched on as Bakugo was completely enveloped by Aizawa's seriously long scarf. The caught blonde, finally realizing the futility of his actions and recognizing the threat in his teacher's words, roughly ceased his struggling. He settled for glaring at the man. Hoping his point had been made, Aizawa released his captive, only to immediately wish he hadn't. Harming. That kind of thing doesn't apply to that abomination and his sick. Zombie. Thing. That Hugo spat out. His disturbing words, delivered in such a disturbing fashion, quickly earned the disgust of the watching students. Aizawa stood, silently examining what he belatedly realized was another potential villain problem. Midoriya, are you immune to or resistant to pain? Asked with all the seriousness of the grave, the question caught everyone off guard. Those who hadn't met Izuku before were confused. Shouldn't the green-haired teen share the durability of his zombie girl? The imposing boy with glasses, and more so Achako, knew better. But even they were horrified when their classmate responded. T-chan's pain receptors seemed to be non-functional according to all current means of analysis. Izuku was quick to reveal, but I can feel pain just like a normal person, sir. 
That was the truth, sort of. No one really knew if the zombie girl felt pain anymore since they couldn't ask her and she never reacted to injuries. It was merely a best guess. Meanwhile, Aizawa was nodding his head at the expected answer. Regenerators can build up their pain tolerance, just like everybody else, but that's no excuse to harm them, the pro hero said, staring at the aggravated blonde. Katsuki Bakugo, the rules apply to everyone here. Consider this your only warning. With that, the issue was settled, though Aizawa noticed quite a few new developments amongst his wannabe students. Thanks to his experiences as a pro hero, Aizawa had plenty of practice at an aptitude for reading body language. In that regard, the teens before him were open books. From the psychotic rage rolling off of Bakugo, to the forced resignation exuding from Midoriya, he could see an entire story being written before his very eyes. The two clearly had history. Everdenet's acceptance of the blonde's behavior didn't come off as someone unable to defend themselves, but more like someone who'd repeatedly been disallowed from going on the defensive. The exhausted teacher added another mental note, this time to remember to dig up any hidden info on these two. No doubt staff at their previous schools had a hand in things escalating this far. What really concerned Aizawa, though, was the zombie. As Bakugo had attempted to use his quirk, he'd clearly seen the undead girl tense up, ready to take action should violence break out. His unease steamed from one simple fact, there hadn't been any verbal commands from Midoriya for it to react to in that instant. That went better than expected, Izuku muttered to himself as he and T reached their classmates. Looking up, the green-haired teen realized the entire group was staring at him. To be able to control your darkness to such a fine degree, and with such finesse, a boy with the head of a raven greeted him first, sounding quite friendly. I salute you. That was an incredibly creative use of your quirk, a tall girl with a wild, spiky black ponytail agreed. More people should learn to think like you. The green-haired teen was speechless at the continued support. Could have been better, the crimson-haired boy with shark teeth added, more nonchalantly than antagonizing. You should have had her throw it for you. Not everyone uses brute force to solve their problems. The girl with cute frog features defended, taking Izuku's side to his amazement. There's nothing wrong with being imaginative, Kiro. Aizawa, seeing his wannabes getting distracted, tabled his current thoughts and pinched the bridge of his nose. He'd taken his hands of the reins for one second. Enough chit-chat. The gruff teacher interrupted, returning the feeling of dread to the students. Play friends after you've survived the day. Uncowed, Izuku only nodded at the words, thumb and forefinger cupping his chin. As expected of the pro hero eraser head, the green-haired teen said to the surprise of his classmates. And teacher, no room for nonsense. Oh, so you know who I am? Aizawa asked, actually interested that some kid had recognized him. He was an underground hero for a reason. And what gave it away? Or did you guess? Izuku shook his head in the negative, stepping to the side so the rest of the class could see him. He held out a fist, palm up. Wear specialized goggles around the neck that don't look like they'd impair vision. One finger shot up. Uses a capture tool that's disguised as a simple and plain scarf that's easy to wear and move around. Two fingers. A quirk is suddenly unable to be activated without explanation. Three fingers. And, I apologize sir, but I don't think any one of us recognize your face even though we know you have to be a pro to teach here. A fourth and final finger rose up. Izuku smiled. I can't think of another hero that fits all of those descriptions, the green-haired teen announced, earning a small smirk from the underground hero. His classmates continued to stare. Aizawa suddenly turned to his gaping wannabes, bloodshot eyes wide and frightening. Enough talk. Get ready to show me what you can do. Return to the task at hand, the hopefully future class of one went about carrying out the orders for the different tests. Aizawa took more mental notes as his wannabes tackled their tests, some preferred a direct approach, others showcased their creativity, and a few even exhibited balance, skill, and ingenuity. As the school day approached its end, the pro hero already had a pretty good idea on how to guide a few of the more obvious talents he'd been given. Tenya Ida, who came off to those around him as imposing with his stern-looking glasses, has scored highest in the 50-meter dash and above average in the long jump. He revealed himself to be rather narrow-minded, however, playing by the book a little too much without any consideration for imaginative solutions. Tackling the tests as ordered was all well and good, but a hero needed to be open to all alternatives in every situation. Achako Uraka, a brunette with perpetually rosy cheeks, had completely bested everyone at the softball throw. He was a little miffed that she'd sent the test module into low orbit, but it showcased her quirk's ability so he'd gotten over it. She'd also managed to score the best at the long jump, but he'd noticed that the longer she used her quirk, the sicker she appeared to get. Definitely something to work on in the near future. Momo Yeyurazu, his most. The chore looking wannabe, had shown without a doubt that she deserved the recommendation she'd received. The tall girl had scored high marks in most tests, making excellent use of her quirk to fabricate any and all tools that could make her life easier. She demonstrated higher than average physical conditioning as well, managing to excel even in situations her quirk couldn't be used. He'd have to focus on her speed though, both physically and in quirk use, she was the slowest in the class at the moment. Shoto Todoroki, the heterochromatic with a history probably on par with Midoriya's in what hadn't been recorded. His dual hair color stood out, as did the scar over his left eye, but his high marks spoke louder of his ability. 
The kicker with the boy was that he absolutely refused to use half of his quirk, a mindset that needed to be addressed sooner rather than later. Sui was Sui, a shorter girl whose quirk gave her frog-like features, was what Aizawa would appreciate all average heroes aspiring to be. She'd easily scored above most of her classmates, easily enough that it was clear she was holding back strength and skill to spare. He decided she'd make a fine standard to grade everyone else against. Izuku Midoriya, the top scorer in the practical exam, had managed to surprise him more than once with how he tackled the tests. The softball throw had been just a peek into the mind of the teen, a glimpse at a creativity that was rare to see these days. Having himself thrown by his zombie for the long jump, achieving a respectably above average distance, was a sight to see. So too was watching the undead girl easily match said distance with little effort. Above average, that term applied to Midori in almost every test now that he thought about it. The endurance tests had presented interesting results of course, such as the green-haired teen would have everyone beat on number of repetitions made, but not speed, and that he could do all of this without sweating or showing signs of muscle fatigue. He didn't know what to make of the zombie matching his wannabe in perfect imitation. Something's doesn't feel right, Aizawa muttered, glancing at the now exhausted students, specifically the green-haired teen. Every test he'd noticed it more and more, the zombie seemed to act with a degree of autonomy more akin to a thrall of a minion, pet quirk than a creation of a zombification quirk. She wasn't only obedient, she could react on her own, which didn't make any sense at all with Midoriya's quirk registered as blood repair. The file only said the teen's blood repaired biological structures it came into contact with, unsettling as that apparently allowed him to reanimate corpses to do his bidding. But the problem with that description was it failed to explain the behavior of the zombie. The undead girl acted more like loyal pet, not a mindless puppet. Sometimes he hated how ineffectual the QRA proved themselves to be when handling delicate matters such as this. Not right in the slightest. Aizawa muttered a second time, now taking note of Katsuki Bekugo. The explosive blonde had spent the entire time glaring at anyone who managed to best him in even one test, which meant at this point almost everyone had drawn his ire in some fashion. He knew the type, had seen it a hundred times before, the top dog of middle school who couldn't come to terms with the truth of the real world. To be honest, he'd expected it to have been Endeavor's kid, not a random upstart. Okay then, Aizawa called out, drawing the attention of his wannabes. Once the teens were all looking at him, the gruff teacher clicked a button on his phone's screen. An innocent beep later, and a holographic display board popped into existence. In two columns of ten, the student hopefuls were ranked. These are the results for today, the pro hero announced, taking in the stress looks as each wannabe desperately searched for their name. Logically, if they'd been thinking, the only name that should matter to them was the bottom one. On that note, about last place being expelled, Izuku took in the sight of his name, sitting comfortably at 7th, with a smile. He felt good. He and T had earned that spot together through all their hard work. But he knew he still had a long way to go before he'd earned the title of hero, this was just another step. Contrary to the green-haired boy, the shortest member of the class, Minoru Minta, had collapsed to his knees. To his absolute horror, it was his name he found at the 20th spot on the list. Only now did he truly regret skipping all those gym days in middle school. It was a lie, Aizawa revealed, just something to incentivize you all to go beyond your self-imposed limitations. Too tired to cause much of a scene, the now official members of Class 1 had still made their disbelief at what they were being told known. It wasn't true. Hayauka Jairo asked, her ear jacks writhing like agitated snakes. The punk rock girl obviously felt relieved, but at the same time strangely cheated. Crossing her arms under her developed chest, Momo nodded in agreement, before looking down in shame. If you think about it, it was kind of obvious, the mature girl said, sure in her belief that a prestigious academy wouldn't risk its image by expelling students on the first day. I'm sorry for not saying anything earlier. Uncaring as to the veracity of the girl's belief, Aizawa turned to leave. The pro hero had a lot to consider with this batch of students, not to mention warnings to pass around during his debrief with the rest of the freshman teachers. He'd bet his melatonin that at least one of his co-workers weren't aware of the zombie or the explosive kid. Izuku himself wasn't quite sure what he thought about Momo's declaration, but decided fretting over it wouldn't do anyone any good now. Ready to call it a day, the green-haired teen just wanted to follow his classmates back to the locker rooms in peace, change, and go home. His classmates, on the other hand, had other plans. Midoriya, the teen with the raven head, Fumikage Takoyami, said suddenly, coming up to the boy in question out of the blue, as a fellow master of the darkness, I cannot help but dwell upon the curiosity that is your control over your undead servant. Would you grant me the honor of revealing your methods? When I had by this point split to their separate locker rooms, Izuku, half change, nearly fell over when he realized the raven-headed teen's inquiry had earned them the attention of some of the other boys. He kind of couldn't blame them though, he supposed, they'd noticed T waiting just outside the locker room. Master of, wait, are you talking about T-chan? Izuku asked, confused and thrown off balance by his new classmate's manner of speaking. And being approached at all, Takoyami nodded solemnly, glad that he'd been understood. Too often was it that those he spoke to looked back at him as if he spoke madness. It was refreshing to be acknowledged. I am, the raven-headed teen confirmed. 
although now I find myself ever the more curious. Is T the corpse's true name, or is it something you provided when you took control? Hearing him speak further, it was clear to Izuku that Takoyami was being overly dramatic on purpose, though he couldn't be sure if it was how the teen normally spoke or was the result of a lonely scholastic life. If it were the latter, then he'd at least met a kindred spirit. Well, yes, her true name was, his T, Izuku replied, eyes filling with sadness. As for control, she's an extension of my quirk now. Honestly, I wish I could have saved her instead. Saved. Takoyami breathed, unable to contain his surprise. Realizing what he'd said, he shook his head. No, think not of answering further. Truly, it must have been a most painful experience. The raven-headed teen had no idea just how appreciative his green-haired counterpart was for being allowed to avoid reliving the traumatic events that had ended with the existence of the undead girl for a little longer. As the class necromancer and local edgelord continued their talk in quieter tones, Bakugo sat by himself, working himself even farther into his scorching rage. The apprehension tests had been a hard blow for him, his rifle place at the top taken again and again by smiley extras, people he knew were weaker than him. The freak's victories over him were the worst though, not even suffered at the hands of combat moves, just cheap tactics and becoming of a hero. What really boiled his blood was how much attention Romero was getting for his tricks, attention that should have been his for the taking. How could anyone not be disgusted by the mere existence of such a grotesque quirk? You too ready? Came the sudden call of Denki Kaminari, a blonde with a happy face. The question visibly startled the so-called dark kids of the group. We're all leaving to get our things from the classroom now. Some of us are gonna hang out after. Wanna join? Touched that he was being offered an opportunity he'd never been given by a classmate before, Izuku nevertheless had to deny the invitation. Maybe next time, the green-haired teen said, need to feed T-chan first before heading out. Even spoken so nonchalantly, the declaration still managed to regain the attention of the rest of the boys. Would it be an imposition if I stayed to observe? Takoyami asked, fully expecting his plea to be rejected. I find my curiosity still itching to be sated. What does a corpse require as sustenance? What rituals need be involved? Unnoticed by the rest of the boys, a now pale Bakugo quickened his pace, throwing his dirty clothes haphazardly into his bag. The blonde knew what was involved in feeding that abomination, and he knew he didn't want to be anywhere near the freak when it happened. I, I mean, I don't mind. But are you sure? Izuku asked, wary of exposing and potentially losing his, weird and barely understandable, friend to the sight of T's feeding. I don't know if you'd be able to. Stomach it. Takoyami, far from being off-put by the green-haired teen's reservations, gave a firm nod and affirmation. Dark Shadow, the symbiotic quirk entity that lived inside of the raven-headed teen, poked its head out and gave a thumbs up as well. Reassured, Izuku gave the two a bright smile, and the two went to exit the locker room. Crossing the threshold back into UA proper, the two boys were immediately joined by T, who oddly enough seemed to give off a vibe of impatience to return to Izuku's side. After a short walk back to their classroom, the two realized the rest of class when I had already left to pursue their own devices. Now alone, Takoyami started when he noticed the green-haired teen pull out a penknife from his pocket. For what purpose is there to draw a blade? The raven-headed teen asked in mild alarm. While his trust in his classmate, and hopefully new friend, was sizable, his overactive imagination was quickly getting the better of him. It was with an ever more quickly beating heart he noticed the presence of the undead beside him. Though surely Izuku wasn't dark enough to commit murder for food. Takoyami could only watch in fascinated horror as the green-haired teen he'd just met raised the knife to his own arm and positioned the blade to stab. T-chan feeds best from fresh sources, Izuku said sweetly, an affectionate smile on his face that appeared more twisted with each passing second. And you know, you can't get any fresher than the living. Now please, try not to scream. Izuku hated playing on the raven-headed teen's exaggerated sense of drama, but the truth of his blood wasn't something he was comfortable with sharing just yet. Better that his classmates thought that T could survive off of any living thing, instead of just him. Unbeknownst to the two boys, Momo and Tsuyu had been delayed in leaving the girls' locker room, waylaid due to searching for the taller girl's lost student ID card. They also didn't notice as the girls watched Izuku plunge the tiny blade downward, carved into his own flesh to draw as much blood as possible, and did it all without any outward care for Takoyami's contorting face. Gods, the blood, the pain, the raven-headed teen nearly shouted. How can you withstand such agony? Unperturbed at this point, Izuku removed the penknife from his hand and cleaned the blade against its back, the only part not covered in blood. This pain is nothing compared to letting T-chan starve. Izuku replied, actively avoiding the real question. You really don't want to see her get that bad. When enough of the crimson liquid had pooled in his wounded palm, the green-haired teen raised the limb to T's face. The zombie girl eagerly leaned forward, beginning to lick away the blood with deft tongue strokes. It was then that the two boys heard the unmistakable sound of dry heaving. Concerned, they rushed toward the source around the corner, T gently taking Izuku's hand to continue her meal. Kiro croaked Suyu, her worry carrying through when the boys found her. The green-haired teen was quick to notice that the frog girl's wide eyes were staring intently at his bleeding hand. Don't worry, it doesn't even hurt anymore, using his non-damaged hand, Izuku waved away the concern emanating from his classmates, downplaying the gruesome scene the best option. 
and look, it's already closing. It won't even leave a scar. The green-haired teen's reassurance did nothing to alleviate the fact that the disturbing sounds of a tongue lapping up blood continued to echo through the hallway. You don't have to do that every day, do you? Hiro, Tsuyu asked, still losing worry. The distress confused Izuku, who was unused to such regard. Of course not, the green-haired teen assured, hoping to bring peace to his new friend and the cute girl that for some reason was showing care for his well-being. Once a week is usually enough if there's continuous activity. Although she does need emergency feeding if something drastic happens that requires regeneration. As he finished speaking, Izuku's self-inflicted wound finished closing. Meal complete, T dropped the green-haired teen's hand and returned to standing behind him. Seeing this, the three teens stood awkwardly, unsure how to continue. Well, anyway, what brought you back here? Izuku asked hesitantly, desperate to get out of the uncomfortable silence. His question did the job, and the short girl stiffened, no doubt remembering what had led her to the scene in the first place. Ah, uh, that's because Momo here forgot, eh? Momo, Kiro, Suyu's explanation died as she pointed to her side, only to notice that she was pointing at empty air. It took only moments to decipher that the mature girl had fled the scene, unable to find a private enough place to empty her stomach. Izuku should have known, for all the acceptance he'd found so far, there'd still be some who reacted negatively to glimpses of his quirk's true nature. But for now, life hadn't turned out as bad as he'd expected. When a classroom, day of battle trial. Sitting at his desk, Izuku lightly reminisced over the last few days. He'd been continuously surprised by how much kinder the school in general was to him than his past schools had been. For once, people didn't outright run away from him, though admittedly a few shied away and kept their distance. And so far no one had openly refused to partner up with him during classes, although Momo still made an effort to find an alternative before giving in and Bakugo hadn't been given a chance to be an exception to this rule yet. Teachers didn't seem to care about T or her antics, only asking once each whether she was infectious or not, or if he was keeping her well fed. The pro heroes didn't flinch at the occasional groan or grunt either, rather they acted as if nothing had happened at all. The best part of this tolerance was that half of them didn't even seem to mind when the zombie girl knelt to lay her head on his lap while he did his work. That wasn't to say that Ida and Minda didn't voice their discomfort at such scenes though. Takoyami had continued to be a source of surprise for him too, he was glad to say. The raven-headed boy made it a point to engage in casual conversation with him on a daily basis, although he still struggled to understand his new friend's obsession with darkness and the occult. Yes, all in all Izuku found that classes at UA were more than pleasant to attend. But today, today turned out to be the one he'd been both looking forward to and dreading in equal measure. And it all started in the afternoon when the first teacher to enter the classroom wasn't Aizawa as they'd expected, but I'm coming through the door like a normal person. All Might, wearing his Silver Age costume, the number one hero posed magnificently as he entered the room in no way like a normal person. All smiles, the symbol of peace dropped his bomb-worthy news on 1A. Today you'll have your first taste of heroism. All Might boomed, smile widening. And to do that you'll first need these. Pressing a concealed button, the muscular hero revealed hidden compartments in one of the walls numbered from 1 to 20. The slots popped open, each revealing a respectively numbered case. Heroes need costumes, not the least of reasons being so that they can become symbols in their own right, All Might announced, gaining excited shouts from his students as they realized what they were being given. So go, change and meet me at today's designated training ground. Just as quickly as he'd arrived, the number one hero darted away, gone in the blink of an eye. In seconds the members of Wana had descended on the wall of cases. It wasn't a shocker his classmates would be so exuberant, Izuku decided. They'd all designed their own costumes before submitting them along with their applications, so everyone was eager to see their visions brought to life. Unfortunately, the green-haired teen knew he didn't have as much to cheer over as the others. Yue, as great as it was, like all other hero schools was governmentally mandated to contract outside agencies to actually produce their students' first costumes. This was ostensibly to make sure that no incoming newbie snuck in an unfair or dangerous advantage in their gear. The issue with this was that these agencies were allowed to hold their own standards when producing these costumes. And it was just Izuku's luck that regenerators, designated more often than not as mutant types, weren't held in high regard by support agencies. These factors led to almost guarantee that his costume would be made by one of the cheaper companies, not that he minded too much. If it came down to it, he'd just contract one of the support course students when he could and upgrade his gear. As for right now, there wasn't anything for it. UA Campus, Ground Beta, feeling exposed, Izuku gazed at the various costumes his classmates had appeared in. All of them were flashy or showed off the physical rewards of their hard work. It was almost too difficult to look at the girls for this very reason, their strength and beauty glowing like the sun. And then there was him, who looked. Fucking Romero. This is a hero school, not a goddamn horror movie, Bakugo spat, incredibly quick to throw a jab. Unlike the blonde's previous attempts to put down the green-haired teen, this time there were a few snorts from their classmates. What made you think dressing like a fucking tax collector was a good idea? If one were ignorant, like the explosive blonde, it would be easy to see why Izuku's hero costume appeared less than impressive at first glance. The suit consisted of dark green dress pants with a matching vest and tie, contrasted sharply by a crimson red dress shirt underneath. 
The black dress shoes weren't anything to call home about either, but this was an appearance only. Izuku had designed the entire suit to be made of a specific type of ballistic weave so that even if he ended up with the cheapest of support agencies, if they followed his specs to the letter, then it'd be incredibly hard for the material to be punctured or cut by normal means or strength. His plain dress shoes also held secrets. He requested steel toes and ankle protectors be inserted into them, the metal guards no doubt going to pack a painful punch in the event of a pinch. The only cosmetic add-ons he'd sprung for, unlike certain other classmates who'd overindulged, were the fingerless gloves that covered his hands and the round sunglasses that hid away his eyes. In his opinion, the complete look gave him a slightly more mature and professional look. I can't believe you, Midoriya. Minda nearly cried, eyeing T with an overly dramatic, tearful look. You squandered such potential. Why did you dress her like that? and now everyone was staring at T. The zombie girl's hero costume could be described as militaristic. At best, the overall jumpsuit was patterned in green camouflage while brown combat boots and gloves adorning her hands and feet. Reinforced elbow and knee pads both kept joints protected and allowed for devastating blows. And that was just the beginning. A black harness complemented the undead girl's developed chest while also housing tools ideal for rescue, a coil of reinforced rope, a collapsible shovel, miniature lanterns, a med kit, and even a crowbar were all tightly secured for optimal movement. The only cosmetic addition was a pair of colored sports shades that covered her eyes, an attempt to conceal an unsettling red gaze from civilians and those others who didn't need any more stress in a rescue scenario. You know, Suyu intervened quickly, a gesture that Izuku appreciated to the point of beaming at the frog girl, he kind of looks like a detective. Doesn't he? Hero. A pair of floating gloves and boots bounced over to the slightly hunched green-haired teen. One of the gloves acted as if it were resting on a chin in thought. Hmm, wouldn't he need a trench coat though? Came the girly voice of Toru Hagakure. Gyro scoffed, drifting over to join the conversation. She made an attempt to rest a hand on Toru's shoulder, missed, and settled on crossing her arms. You know that most real-life detectives don't actually wear trench coats, right? The punk rock girl asked. Before the invisible girl could answer, All Might arrived in a sudden burst of speed, wind, and dust. All right, you zygotes. Here's today's most important lesson. All Might boomed, standing tall and proud, every inch the symbol of peace he was. Where you fight is just as important as who you fight. Why? Because when you use your quirks in public, and you all have quite the powerful quirks, you could easily jeopardize lives if you're not careful. Class 1 stood, devouring the words of wisdom from the number one hero without moving a muscle. There were still some who couldn't believe they'd actually gotten the chance to have the larger-than-life man as their teacher. Statistically speaking, most hero-villain encounters are in enclosed spaces whether you know it or not, banks, important facilities like hospitals or schools, and even secret lairs. All Might continued, that's why today's training is going to be inside this building here, so that you all may learn to overcome the obstacles that arise from combat in confined spaces. That's right, this is your first battle trial. The respectful silence was suddenly broken by exuberant shouts and exclamations of excitement. Their first combat class, the teens couldn't believe it was finally here. Distracted, the students of one amidst All Might pulling out a garishly colored box with the word lots written on it. Time is limited so we'll be drawing lots to see who partners with who. The symbol of peace announced. Then we can go over the details of the trial. Edda abruptly raised his hand, speaking immediately after doing so. Sir, isn't there a better way to choose such important roles? The tall boy asked. Izuku mentally facebombed, wondering why he bothered to raise his hand if he was going to speak anyway before being called on. He stepped closer to his uptight classmate. Think about it like this, the green-haired teen said, pros oftentimes don't get to choose who they end up working with in a crisis. This kind of simulates their randomosity. Seeing the rationale in Izuku's words, he had bowed to their teacher with words of apology. All Might waved the remorse away with a smile, putting a hand in the box he held. It's fine, young Ida. Now, let's see who the first team is. The number one hero dug around before withdrawing two slips with names written on them. Suiwa Sui. You'll be partnered with Izuku Midoriya, Jijiana AHH, and T. A tentative laughter in response to the zombie girl's almost offended sounding groan was enough to almost cover Izuku's sigh of relief at not being paired with Bekugo. The only one to notice was his new partner, Tsuyu, who found the green-haired teen fun to watch. After that, pairs were created quickly, and before long all of one was partnered up and ready to go. From somewhere unseen by his students, All Might pulled a second box, this one just as garishly colored as the first, with H and V printed on it. Now let's see who our first hero and villain teams are. All Might shouted to the cheers of his students. The pro hero drew from the new box. Bakugo and Ada will be on the hero team. It was at that moment that Izuku felt the ice-cold grip of cosmic irony curl around his heart. There was no way. All Might drew a second card. It would just be his luck if, while Asui and Midoriya will be on the villain team. The declaration was received with cursing from Izuku and a disappointed croak from Tsuyu, neither wanting to be villainous in their first training exercise. Bakugo sniggered loudly, only adding fuel to the fire. The look in the blonde's eyes couldn't be mistaken for heroic in the slightest. Minutes later, second floor of the training building. The exercise hadn't turned out to be too difficult, all things considered. The villain teams would be given a fake nuclear weapon to protect until a timer ran out, 
and the hero teams had to either secure said weapon by touching it or capture both of their opponents. The villain teams would be given a surprisingly large amount of time to prepare while the hero teams had to wait outside and then go in totally unprepared. All Might justifying this by reminding his students that real villains hardly ever played fair. Which really amounted to nothing in the end, as neither Izuku nor Tsuyu really wanted to be villains, and the duo decided to leave their fake weapon on the second floor as a result. They both agreed to be done with the exercise as soon as possible. Villains, we don't look like villains, Izuku groused, railing against their unlucky draw. And Bakugo sure as salt doesn't act like a hero. It was a lose-lose situation for the two green-haired teens. If they won then their reputation would be tarnished for being too good at acting villainously, but if they lost then. They lost. Ada at least looks the part, Kiro, Tsuyu offered, joining her partner's rant. Even while doing so, the frog girl seemed more intent on calming Izuku down than adding her own complaints. The green-haired teen knew in a straight fight his only chance against opponents like these two, who'd been born with amazing quirks fit for heroes and the drive to reach said title, would have been to turn them against one another. He was even confident he could easily achieve such an outcome, but concern over his partner's reputation in the face of such tactics kept him from bringing this fact up. Yeah, you're right, Izuku said, turning toward the frog-themed girl. Was it just him, or did she look even more attractive while crouched down like that? I'm sorry you had to see me complaining like that, Asui-san. Call me Tsu-chan, Tsuyu answered suddenly. Izuku nearly fell over. The green-haired teen attempted to collect himself before staring at the frog girl in disbelief. With her naturally expressionless face, it was hard to read her intentions, but looking into her black eyes made it clear beyond all doubt that she was being honest. Why you? Why? Izuku stuttered, his mind crashing to a halt. Su, Chen, as if, as if we were, friends. The idea that a girl, a pretty girl at that, wanted to be friends with someone like him of all people was completely absurd. There's no way the request had been real. Hiro, Suyu croaked while giving a cute note in response. The frog girl didn't smile, but inside it felt good. She'd already taken a step toward her self-imposed goal of making many new friends at her new school. Izuku shook himself free from his stupor, a guarded expression suddenly appearing in his eyes. Does that include T-chan? He asked, already knowing such a demand would most likely end in the retraction of the offer of friendship. Suyu merely shrugged, glanced at the zombie girl, and stuck her tongue out in thought. Sure, why not? Hero, came the frog girl's simple and honest reply. As if to prove her acceptance, the heroine in training approached T without concern, poking her in the cheek like a curious child. Suyu was never one to judge a quirk by its appearance, knowing from experience that some weren't pretty to look at and others were downright terrifying. People with quirks like those usually ended up lonely, like her dear friend from middle school, and she knew they were the ones in dire need of real friendship. So, then, would it be too much to ask? And you don't have to if you don't want to. But, could, could you call me, Izukun? The words, calling up a nickname from long ago, were forced past a throat choked between fear and hope. Izuku hadn't been called such since kindergarten, when a girl he'd shared a bento with had giggled it at him. But Hugo had kicked her the next day, and he hadn't stopped until she'd tearfully promised to never talk to the little green freak ever again. Sure, I don't see a problem with the, why are you crying Izukun? Kiro, Suyu hadn't seen the problem with such a silly request. Izukun, she probably would have come up with the nickname herself in a day or two. But then her new friend had burst into tears. I'm just, so happy, Izuku confessed through hiccuping sobs. It's silly, I know, but I'm just so happy, that you're my friend. The green-haired teen tried to wipe away the waterworks, but to little result. At least it was enough to earn a cute smile from the frog girl who just changed his life. That smile, which had slipped by Tsuyu's normal mask of reservation, came from her understanding of the need for such a pure offering of friendship. Jjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjj
Hiro, the questioning croak only fueled Izuku's determination. This girl was too cute to allow harm to come her way, even if she was probably fit enough to kick his or anyone else's ass easily. Gently, the green-haired teen took the frog girl's hands, hoping she wouldn't hate him for the bold move. I know how to win, but it could get us labeled as villainous for a while, Izuku's words seemed ominous, but they piqued Suyu's curiosity, especially when her partner instantly followed up with, but we don't have do it unless you're okay with it. So, after a moment of thought, the frog girl decided to give in to a little competitiveness. It would do those hero wannabes good to work for their win. They needed the practice after all. Okay, I'm an Izukun, Suyu said, nodding to show her agreement. But how are you proposing we do this? Do you know their weaknesses? It was all well and good to desire to win, but everyone knew that without a plan even the greatest could be defeated. After all, a tactical mind could topple even the strongest quirks if properly incentivized. Oh, I'm not going to use their weaknesses, Izuku corrected, I'll be playing to their strengths. The green-haired teen undid his tie, drawing a menacing groan from the zombie girl behind him. In that moment, Titsuyu, T appeared so much more than a puppet made from dead meat. We're going to get creative. Izuku's final words would plague Tsuyu's dreams for many years to come. But not in the form of nightmares. Cursed blood. Chapter 5. A sinister success. Tenya Ida found himself, in a word, concerned. His partner, while not his first choice, had proven himself to be quite strong and intelligent, but that wasn't the source of his apprehension. Bakugo pacing back and forth before the entrance to their test building like a caged animal, palms already popping with small explosions and a snarl twisting his face did. The tall, bespectacled teen didn't know how to calm the blonde down either, he couldn't see any reason for such obvious hostility. It was clear to him, however, that Bakugo had no qualms about not holding back against their opponents, which was also alarming. The two green-themed teens may have proven themselves worthy of their places in the hero course without a doubt, but they couldn't possibly pose too much of a threat against them with the quirks and combat capabilities they held. Can you please calm down? Ida asked, again, for the fifth time. Even equipped in his hero costume as he was, which most agreed gave him a futuristic knight appearance, his displeasure at his partner's behavior was unmistakable. Without missing a beat, or looking away from what he was glaring at, Bakugo shoved a gloved hand in Aida's direction, middle finger raised skyward. Shut the fuck up stupid four eyes. The blonde shouted, still glaring at the test building. The glower only paused when the explosive teen took a moment to check the numerous belts and clippings of his hero costume. Special attention was paid to the two grenade-shaped arm guards he wore. Aida sighed, once again deciding to ignore the offensive and vulgar gestures and language of his partner. This time, he merely pinched the bridge of his nose under his helmet in exasperation. What is you so restless? Ida asked now, hoping that a chance to unload his frustrations would allow the pacing blonde to cool off slightly. Are you troubled by our opponents? Their quirks, do you think? A sudden thought stopped Ida cold, one he hadn't considered before. While it was true that most mutant-type quirk users face the wrath of society's quirk hierarchy to one degree or another, his family was a rare and special case. Since their mutation only caused minute changes to their physicality, namely wherever their particular variety of engine's exhaust pipes appeared, they was easily hidden. Out of sight, out of mind as it were. As his family had gained prominence over the years, less and less attention was brought to their hereditary quirk's nature and more was placed on its power. Today, he couldn't think of a single person who'd ever looked at Anita and disparaged them based on quirk alone. But what if Bakugo was being so negatively affected by a more obvious mutation? Do you? Do you find Asui-san dangerous? Ida asked hesitantly, hoping his partner wasn't about to be revealed as a quirkist. The question at least got a long-awaited answer from the angry blonde. Ugly frog face. Dangerous. That Hugo threw back, turning to face the extra that had the honor of being his partner. Don't make me laugh. That malformed thing doesn't even register on my radar. I bet money a small explosion to the face would be all it would take to put it down. Ida reared back from the blonde's deranged, psychopathic words, more worried now than ever. This was worse than just a quirkist mindset. What is wrong with, how can you even, he had it couldn't even fully form his emphatic reprimand, his temper had caught so quickly. Before the speedster could attempt to collect himself, a sharp buzzing of an alarm signaled the start of the exercise. The u u u a faculty office. For the third day in a row, Aizawa sat at his second desk and gave the files of two of his students a once-over. It had turned out his hunch had been right, Katsuki Bakugo and Izuku Midoriya had been classmates since kindergarten all the way through middle school. What had caused the normally unflappable man to need two nights of breathers in between research and this discovery was the accompanying lack of data regarding any interaction between the two. It was abnormal, to say the least. Bakugo's record was full of surprisingly high grades, not at all the record of the brainless delinquent his temper portrayed him as. And he'd not been able to find a single mark against the kid, which was more than a little suspicious given the blonde's attitude. There was no way the bomber hadn't gotten into, at the very least, a few fights over the years. Midoriya, on the other hand, didn't seem to have gone a handful of days without suffering beatings. Beatings, the gruff teacher had noted, administrators in all three schools, especially the middle school, had downplayed to the point that a culprit had never even been investigated. The infuriating reason for such oversight. 
a single line, repeated over and over again, no evidence of lasting harm, that both teens had walked away from governmentally mandated scholastic psych evaluations with spotless all-clears was. Such a load of bullshit, Aizawa muttered to the otherwise empty room, taking a second to shake away his rising frustrations at the obvious manipulations of glory-seeking institutions. The brusque teacher decided to take a chance and see how severe the situation might actually be. Using UAS special search engine designed by some of I Island's finest, the pro hero input Alder a junior high. Immediately, multiple flags were raised. It looked like this wasn't the first time the middle school had looked the other way for students they felt showed promise. Aizawa almost did a double take, almost, when he read that one such rising star had been expelled from Shikesu a couple of years back for the attempted rape of a classmate. That's it. I'm demanding this school be blacklisted from our acceptance role, Aizawa grumbled, standing. Seeing the time on the office's clock, he stopped before hastily grabbing his phone. I need to warn All Might. We need to separate those two, before it's too late. Aizawa Power walked out of the faculty room and down the hall while the phone rang, hoping that his muscular idiot of a co-worker hadn't done something stupid like pitted the blonde and Verdinet against each other. Or, God forbid, he could have put them on the same team. It's true he didn't have the whole picture yet, some might even label his next actions as paranoid. But as he picked up his pace the pro-hero knew in his gut he had enough evidence to warrant his behavior. There was little doubt in his mind that Bakugo had been the one to bully Midoriya, administrators had tampered with her outright neglected to file reports, and it was probably all in the hopes of gaining renown by having the explosive blonde attend UA. Why Midoriya was the victim was still a mystery, as was why the green-haired teen had never fought back. But Aizawa swore on his melatonin he'd find out. Brown Beta, Test Building the hero team of Bakugo and Ida reached the last unsearched room of the first floor in a state of increasing annoyance. There had not been a single clue of their opponent's whereabouts to be found yet, and while one knew that gathering information before striking was the smart thing to do, the other couldn't care less about anything else other than finding his target and unleashing hell. Making their way to the stairs in hopes of better luck on the next floor, Bakugo decided he'd had enough. From Eru, where the fuck are you? A blonde scream reverberated through the empty building so strongly that Ida cringed away not only from the lack of subtlety, but also the sudden ringing in his ears. The bespectacled teen was about to chastise his degenerate of a partner, again, for his choice of language when the unthinkable occurred. I'm right here, Kaken, came Izuku's voice from the top of the stairs. Snapping their heads up, the hero team saw the regenerator standing on the landing, just looking down at them. Ada would swear from that day forward that the temperature dropped 20 degrees Celsius after that strange name was thrown out. He would never believe that it was once a term of endearment and not an insult of some kind. Fucking Romero, what did I say about calling me that? Bakugo growled in a dangerously low voice, his right hand open and dripping with sweat from running all over the first floor. Instead of answering, the green-haired teen simply laughed before darting upstairs. Unprepared for such an action, it took a second for the blonde to process what had just happened. And when he did, come back here so I can kill you. Bakugo screamed bloody murder as he ran up the stairs, chasing his nemesis as if nothing else mattered. Ada moved to follow, but as soon as he reached the second floor himself, he noticed something peculiar. Shoeprints, marked with yellow paint, trekked from down one of the hallways to up the stairs where Midoriya had gone. A trail, Ada muttered, peering down the paint-covered hall, originating from this floor. It couldn't be as simple as it appeared, could it? Although, logically speaking, it would be in the villain team's best interest. I see, Ada said to himself, nodding once. Midoriya's acting as a decoy. It's too bad he didn't notice the paint. Decision made, Bakugo could handle himself after all. The bespectacled teen followed the trail of paint until he reached the central hallway at the end of the corridor. On the floor, with shoe prints splattering out of it, spread an innocent puddle of yellow paint in front of a door at the other end of the hall. It looked as if Midoriya had been in a rush and stepped into it accidentally. So that was your plan. Guide us upstairs while hiding the bomb close to the entrance where we'd never think to look. Ida thought out loud. I suppose they didn't have too much time to make anything more elaborate. Knowing he had to be close to his goal, the bespectacled teen continued down the main hall, keeping an eye out for the frog girl. While she was most likely waiting on the other side of the door, there was always the chance of an ambush. He'd need to be careful regardless, her legs were no doubt incredibly powerful, and the probability of her having enhanced reflexes meant that if he didn't capitalize on his entrance she'd have no trouble both evading him and keeping the bomb secure. Hader really didn't want to chance such a thing. If he took too much time capturing the bomb, and Asui if it came to it, then he wouldn't be able to cut the fight between Katsuki and Midoriya short before the blonde took his violence too far. As he walked and thought, the bespectacled teen felt his foot step in something. Before he could react, a pallet of paint cans fell on him. G-H-H-A-A. Ada screamed, his visor becoming completely obscured. Throwing his arms out, the hero in training wasn't sure if he was trying to keep his balance or fend off any potential attackers. When wiping at the paint failed to work, Eater realized he would have to take the whole helmet off if he wanted to regain his bearings. In his mind, the bespectacled teen cursed his lack of attention to his environment as he did so. 
Of course, there'd be at least one trap. Ada spat in anger, taking a moment to examine his ruined piece of armor. It looked ridiculous, covered in so many brilliant colors calling it garish was literally an understatement. What was worse, the rest of his costume was the same. And the cherry on top. She knows I'm here. Ada realized, sensibly concluding that the trap was more of an alarm than an attempt at waylaying him. Accepting that the element of surprise was now completely gone, Ida continued his trek without ceremony or care. He hoped that Asui wouldn't laugh at his sorry state when he confronted her, appearing more an unsightly psychic bumbling out of a mishap than a valiant hero coming to the rescue. Reaching the door with the puddle, the bespectacled teen opened it, expecting the worst. Instead, he was greeted with the sight of Asui watching him curiously while crouched down in front of the fake bomb. It was obvious to him from the frog girl's intense stare that she was ready to make her stand at any moment. It had gulped, truly believing if he took his eyes off his opponent it would prove fatal. I didn't expect our warning system to fall on you, Kiro, Suyu said, a finger raised to her mouth in thought. Did it hurt? The words may have appeared charitable, but never once did Asui lose track of any move Ada made. The bespectacled teen actually felt like it was more an attempt to distract him with friendly banter than anything, something his brother had warned him about. It took me by surprise, yes, Ida answered, making a circuit around the room under Asui's watchful eye but it won't affect my combat capabilities. Completing his canvassing, Ida took notice of all of the boxes and tools that had been scattered around. No matter how he tried to position himself, he couldn't find a path that he could use to maximize his acceleration. Why didn't you follow your partner? Asui asked. He might already be down and captured without your help, Kiro. Considering the comment to be a classic attempt at lowering morale, Ida merely shook his head in response. He ignored the twinge of doubt that tried to rise up at the frog girl's words. Unlikely, Ida countered, Bakugo is very much a combat-oriented individual. Midoriya is more of a field support type. It's a match in our favor. You should be more worried about yourself Asui-san. That accounted the few steps he had before he could achieve victory. First, he positioned himself in the best spot possible to make a proper line, one with the least amount of junk in the way. Then, he'd immediately strike with his best move. It'd be too quick for the frog girl to react in time to stop him. It felt like cheating, but the bespectacled teen wasn't about to lose his first hero exercise. Sui watched in morbid fascination as everything, to the tiniest detail, unfolded just as Izuku had predicted. From Ida falling into the booby trap, to the way he kept his eyes on her the whole time while positioning himself, it was all happening. As her temporary adversary took his final steps into position, the frog girl couldn't help but remember Izuku's plan. It is a good guy, that much is obvious, so it stands to reason he'll attempt to retrieve the weapon instead of fighting to avoid hurting you, Izuku had said. That's why we're only going to give him one path to achieve that goal. And once he steps into that perfect position to strike, he'll be finished. She'd been worried the bespectacled teen would notice the real trap they'd be setting for him, but Izuku had calmed that fear easily enough. Don't worry, he'd said, he'll never see the trap. Heda suffers from tunnel vision, so he'll only see you and his target. Izuku's prediction had been terrifyingly accurate. Hida hadn't even thought to ask where T was, and hell, she wasn't even hiding. Even now, as the bespectacled teen took his last step for a perfect line drive charge position, he never noticed the zombie girl standing behind him. A.G.H. It was all the noise Ea could make as he felt his throat being crushed, his legs spasming as he tried to gain enough traction to relieve the pressure on his windpipe. Ever so stealthily, T had managed to come up behind the bespectacled teen and use Izuku's tie as a garrot wire, holding her prey just high enough that the force of his own weight would slowly suffocate him. Then, she raised him higher. You should probably stop struggling. Hida san Kiro, Suyu advised to the hanging teen as she carefully approached. From behind her back, the frog girl pulled out her roll of capture tape. Hida, quickly becoming desperate for air, had resorted to thrashing kicks and elbowing the zombie girl for all he was worth. Unfortunately for him, the attacks had no effect whatsoever. Even as he heard his strikes breaking her ribs, T refused to loosen her hold in the slightest. Before long, black spots began to flitter across the bespectacled teen's vision and his strength started to fail. Now despairing, Ida realized his only hope was for Tsuyu to capture him as quickly as possible and hoped that would be enough for the zombie girl to release him. The monitoring room. All Might and the rest of Wana observed through the camera feeds as everything they'd seen transpire for the last ten minutes came to a head. They watched as Izuku, Tsuyu, and Tia had moved the boxes and tools from where they'd rested against the back wall to haphazardly around the room. They'd watched as Izuku had jury-rigged a booby trap from paint cans and then purposefully stepped through a puddle of the stuff. Now everything made sense, from the selection of the floor to how Izuku had greeted the hero team. That was. Evil, Minda was the first to voice his opinion. Judging by the looks on his classmates' faces, it wasn't as widely shared as he believed it should be. Momo shook her head, stepping forward from the back to see the screens better. No, it was creative, the mature girl corrected, neither Midoriya nor Asui have the appropriate quirks to face a hero team with that kind of power head-on. Resorting to a tactical approach was the right response. If anything, Bakugo and Ada are at fault for believing their opponents would tackle their roles like grunts. The academic recommendation student of Wana hoped her classmates realize the gravity of what they'd just witnessed. 
Here was proof that being tactical was just as important as being powerful. Still, don't you think they embraced the role of villains a little too much? Mashiro Ajiro, a blonde boy with a muscular tail, said while scratching his chin. The teen thanked his ancestors he didn't have to fight such characters. He doubted his martial arts would be too effective against a zombie. It was especially worrisome because this one wasn't the slow monster depicted in some media. Know thy enemy and know thyself, then you shall not fear the outcome of a thousand battles. Takoyami quoted trying to defend his friend, by perceiving the inner machinations of a villain, a hero's labor is made easier. We should all endeavor to learn by this example. Gyro, more focused on the monitors than the conversation behind her, leaned closer to the screen. The punk rock girl frowned at what she was seeing. So, why did Midoriya stop there? Gyro asked, pointing at the digital display in sarcastic confusion. The screen in question showed the main hall of the test building's fifth floor. Izuku was hidden behind one of the support pillars while Bakugo remained in a connecting hallway, about to enter the chamber. Noticing that another battle was most likely about to occur, everyone's focus turned back to the monitors. All Might readied himself to call a stop to the exercise if either student allowed things to get out of control. Main hall of the fifth floor. Bakugo kicked the door before him open, the full force of his rage nearly ripping it from its hinges, and stepped into the chamber with all the manner of a beast drunk on bloodlust. He was going to make that damnable nerd pay, for never knowing his place, for daring to use that fucking cutesy nickname, for destroying his dream of being the only one from Aldera to make it to UA, and for beating his scores on the apprehension test with cheap tricks instead of physical talent. Today was the day that Goody Two Shoes felt the full brunt of being his prey. You done running. Beck Hugo shouted, raising his hands in preparation. He'd end this farce of a match in one blow. Fucking Romero. The explosive blonde looked at the floor, cursing when he saw it was covered in yellow shoe prints going in every direction. The damn nerd was still playing with him. Running? From what? Izuku's questioning voice resonated throughout the hall, making it even harder to pinpoint his location. No, I've just been waiting for you to get here. But speaking of running, you on the other hand seem a bit winded. Did only a couple of stairs tire you out? Tekken, barely able to see through the red filling his vision, but Hugo twisted around, searching for a hint of the Verdinette's location. His boiling blood only caused him to breathe harder, turn faster as no clue emerged. Shut the fuck up with that name. The blonde thundered, small explosions popping like firecrackers in his hands. So you're hiding now, you fucking coward. Back Hugo, seeing his search tactic was fruitless, attempted to slow his breathing, listening carefully for even a whisper of movement. If that abomination the nerd kept as a pet was in here, then there's no way it'd be able to stay quiet for long. For a few seconds, there was no answer, but then, a rustling sound so faint most would miss it came from his right. It was all the information the blonde needed. Doesn't matter, but Hugo boasted, subtly preparing to strike. Now that you're trapped in here with me, your only option is to take your punishment like the obedient little shit you're supposed to be. And I promise, it won't be quick. The blonde's voice became ever more sadistic as he delivered his threat. He could feel his adrenaline searing its way through him at the prospect of finally, finally being able to go all out on someone who deserved it. This would be a lesson for all the other extras of what happened when you didn't stay out of his way. That's where you're wrong. Kaken, Izuku's rebuff sounded from right behind the pillar that Bakugo had been stalking. Deciding to take his chance, the blonde leapt forward to make his first shot a surprise attack. Die. Bakugo roared, firing off a large explosion. Waving the resulting smoke away hurriedly, it was revealed. He'd hit only empty air. Dot 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 you're the one trapped in here with me. Izuku's finished, his voice coming from just behind Bakugo. Out of sheer instinct, the blonde rolled forward, a whooshing sound whipping by his head. The sound of glass shattering followed immediately afterwards. Bakugo realized if he hadn't reacted in time, a bottle would have just smashed his head. And still, there was no sign of the nerd, only the remains of the broken bottle on the floor. Fucking bastard. Bakugo muttered loudly. He kept his eyes jumping from pillar to pillar, the little shit had to be behind one of them. A soft chuckle echoed around the hall, but there was little humor in it. Already on edge, Izuku's disembodied voice called out, who's the coward now? The taunt hit a nerve, but Hugo growling in anger and, not that he'd ever admit it, even to himself, slight despair. He was too leery of his prey's actions to blindly charge in again, however. Even one as great as he would succumb to a well-placed strike to the back of the head. Are you growling? Izuku asked, still phantasmal. Am I dealing with a dog now? While mocking his childhood tormentor, Izuku was busy readying his plan B, since Plana had failed. He was kind of disconcerted how easy it was to make him prompt two knuckle dusters from discarded wire though. The metal actually made the weapon quite the danger, as it would not only increase the solidity of his punches, but also cut due to the mismatched overlapping filaments. Now he just had to be ready to withstand a beating until the timer sounded. Just fucking die. Back Hugo screamed, shooting an even larger explosion at the pillar in front of him. He didn't know if the nerd was behind it, but if he kept turning the supports to dust then he'd hit him eventually. Prepared for just such a strategy from his aggressor, Izuku had leapt from his cover the moment before the explosion had started. He avoided the destruction of the pillar by millimeters. Back Hugo caught movement from the corner of his eye and watched in disbelief as his prey charged at him while the smoke and ash from his attack still billowed through the air. 
He didn't have enough to redirect his arm, let alone recharge it with enough sweat to be worth a damn. That left only one option. Switching arms, the blonde discharged all the sweat on his offhand, igniting a weak explosion with poor aim. Izuku easily dodged the sloppy assault, although he knew Bakugo probably expected that. After all, this wouldn't be the first time he'd sidestepped one of the blonde's explosions. Motherfucker. Bakugo raged, switching arms again to discharge a small explosion toward the approaching Verdinette's abdomen with his already tired hand. Unlike before, Izuku didn't avoid this blast. This time, the green-haired teen pushed through the searing pain and threw a right hook with as much power as he could muster into Bakugo's temple. The strike stunned the blonde, sending him to the ground slightly disoriented. Unbeknownst to the two combatants, in the monitoring room, every one of their classmates had winced upon witnessing that last brutal exchange. Most worried about Izuku's well-being, that explosion had been at point-blank range. That worry then became horror as they watched the green-haired teen stumble out of the fading smoke, clothes destroyed, with a large chunk of his abdomen turned to charred flesh. All might even move to call off the exercise before staring in stricken fascination as the blackened flesh quickly reverted to its original healthy state. The only remaining evidence an attack had even landed was the boy's torn and burned clothes. You're going to need to try a lot harder if you want to take me down, you know. Izuku said as he walked toward his downed opponent, an opponent that was struggling to stand. The green-haired teen was glad his pain tolerance was so high nowadays, that explosion to the gut had hurt, a lot, but he'd been prepared for it from the beginning. Knowing each injury he took here was an injury his newest friend wouldn't have to suffer made it easier to take as well. Go to hell. Bakugo slurred, his head still ringing. Taking a gamble, the blonde rolled and leapt toward the nerd that thought he was something special, aiming to surprise the little shit with his own well-practiced right swing. Izuku quickly stepped into the surprise attack, caught the offending arm, and, applying a textbook judo throw, sent Bakugo back to the floor with force. While completing the counter, the green-haired teen smoothly added a well-placed punch to the blonde's face, breaking his nose. Bakugo rolled to the side in an attempt to avoid further injury, his face in agony and his brain unable to properly focus. The worst injury, however, was that his nemesis stood there fresh as lettuce and showed not a single sign of being hurt. Watching with questioning eyes as the explosive blonde staggered while trying to stand, Izuku wondered why so little was affecting someone as violent as Bakugo so much. The only thing different from any other day was that he wasn't. Holding back, the two punches the green-haired teen had thrown, while enhanced by his improvised knuckle esters, were also thrown with absolute disregard for self-preservation. They felt normal to him, but they carried so much more force than a normal punch would have, which probably explained the pain in his fingers and wrists that was fading away now. Izuku realized something else in that moment. He could pull off plan C he could win this fight. Do yourself a favor and give up, Izuku taunted his discombobulated opponent, he just can't win. If there was one thing the green-haired teen knew how to do, it was push Katsuki Bakugo's buttons. And if he really wanted to fully defeat the blonde in this fight, he'd need to completely break him. Otherwise, the explosive teen wouldn't learn anything. Bakugo sneered at the little shit that spoke down to him like an enraged, feral animal. The freak stood there, all tall and proud of himself, with an air of superiority hanging off him. It was unacceptable. Pushing with every bit of his fury, the blonde was able to force himself to stand. Not waiting a second, he set off an explosion, creating a smokescreen to buy a few seconds more time. The explosive teen had hoped his damn arm bracers would have been fully charged by now, but he wasn't about to wait any longer. He was going to defeat the pebble that foolishly thought itself a mountain and show it that it should have stayed in its place by the side of the road. I'm going to kill you, Black Hugo shouted, bringing his hands together. He aimed, fully resolved for the resulting blast to incinerate the nerd to the bone. Much to the blonde's surprise, Izuku had already leapt forward. Throwing a straight, the green-haired teen landed a punch to the face just as his opponent's explosion went off in his own. Both combatants fell. Once again, unbeknownst to the two battling teens, the remaining entirety of one was watching from the monitoring room, gasps and screams of horror filling the air at the scene. More than one would beg All Might to stop the fight, a plea the pro hero would have answered if not for the one detail he was quick to point out. Turning his students' attention back to the screen, the concerned classmates bore witness as Izuku rose up, his face nothing but nightmarishly blackened flesh and eyes that ran like egg yolks. Then, before their very eyes, the green-haired teen's face began to return to normal, new skin and eyes growing so fast the changes were perceptible. By the time their classmate finished standing back up he was completely unblemished. You're getting tired, Izuku stated, walking towards a struggling Bakugo. You're slower, and your explosions are getting weaker. You're done for. In fact, you lost this fight the moment you left your partner alone. Bakugo was seeing double at this point, and Dizzy was an extreme understatement to how he was feeling. A blonde hated to admit it, but the freak's punches hit like a truck. Fucking. Romero. You're. Beneath me. Bakugo wheezed, able to finally get his feet under him and stand up. Any of the 17 observers in the monitoring room would have said the blonde looked ready to drop with one more well-placed punch. But like a cornered animal, this was his last stand, and he was going to put everything he had into it. Izuku advanced slowly with fists up, like a boxer. Once within arm's reach of the blonde, Bakugo threw a hand out for a close-range explosion. 
Expecting such reliance on his quirk, the green-haired teen swung his body downward and to the side, avoiding his opponent's attack completely. Seeing the little shit stand tall and undamaged, and ready to throw a punch at him, Bakugo reacted on sheer instinct again and threw out his other hand. He couldn't muster too much sweat, so the resulting explosion was small, but it turned out it wouldn't have mattered anyway. The freak repeated his dodge maneuver, this time to the blonde's opposite side. In that instant, the explosive teen felt something he hadn't truly experienced in a long time. Fear. Watching as Bakugo's eyes broadcasted him entering panic mode, Izuku performed his evasion tactic again and again, whether there was an explosion or not. Each step gained the green-haired teen a bit of momentum, and the instant he knew the blonde couldn't track him anymore, he launched his punch. Bakugo sensed an incoming attack and allowed his instincts to guide his arms to cover his already injured head. Unfortunately for him this worked against him, as the target had been his liver. Searing pain the likes of which he'd never experienced before shot through the blonde, forcing his arms down in a reflexive move to guard a vital zone. This gave Izuku the perfect window to rain punch after punch on Bakugo's unprotected head. Left, then right, then left again, he made full use of his body's momentum. Fully prepared to end the fight with a full-force uppercut, the green-haired teen paused as his opponent stumbled back. Slowly, Bakugo sank to his knees. A half-second later, he collapsed forward face-first to the ground. The blonde was still half-conscious, unable to act any further. How disappointing, Izuku proclaimed in a rather dramatic fashion. All that bravado, all that hatred, and you couldn't even last a full round. Reaching into his back pocket, the green-haired teen withdrew a small metallic case. It might not have shown, but he was hurting all over, and his stomach demanded sustenance immediately. But Izuku wanted to complete the scene for his longtime tormentor, so he could have a glimpse at the bigger picture. You're not even worth the effort of capturing, Izuku continued, snapping open the case. Now, if you don't mind, I need to check on my pretty little partner. Feel free to wait here for the test to end, or crawl downstairs if you want a second round. I bet a real hero could do that. From the case, the green-haired teen picked out a small cylindrical object with rounded ends and placed it into his mouth. When it had become apparent that his healing resulted in severe hunger pains, he and his mother had cooked up some homemade candy, mixing in powdered nuts to add a little protein to the concoction. The candies had come out in shapes that reminded them of cigars, and Inko hadn't been able to help but point out how cool he'd look with them in his mouth. That comment had been immediately followed with pleas for him to not start smoking while he was still young. What a waste of time, Izuku said aloud as he left the room, leaving the semi-conscious Bakugo to seethe on the ground. The original plan C had including capturing the blonde, but the blast to his abdomen had blown his capture tape away. Even so, the green-haired teen doubted the explosive teen would be able to reach Suyu before time ran out, especially since there were multiple stairs in the way. That Hugo, for the time being, couldn't tell up from down, but he knew one thing. He'd just been bested by a nobody who didn't even have the right to even think of doing so. The blonde felt so humiliated he wanted to disappear. This couldn't be happening. In his mind, he'd seen it all, the freak cowering on the floor in fear of his obvious superiority, the justified beating he'd give, the victory he naturally deserved. The world wouldn't stop spinning, and even if it had, Bakugo was having little success at moving his unresponsive limbs. Then, like a miracle from the shitty gods themselves, his bracers flashed red and hummed. His secret weapon was finally ready to use. Against every screaming nerve in his body, Bakugo hauled himself along the floor, crawling as best he could forward. Overshadowing every agony the blonde felt as he moved was a bone-deep ache for one last shot at his nemesis. Romero was going down. The monitoring room. Did Midoriya just pull off a Dempsey roll? Ijiro Kirishima asked his classmates in surprise. The spiky redhead was amazed that such an old-school move worked in these modern times. Takoyami merely crossed his arms, a look of understanding on his avian face. There could be little else one should expect from my fellow master of darkness, the raven-headed teen said, praising his friend in his own way. That brutish simpleton dared gaze into the abyss, and the void overwhelmed his mortal coil. Beside her overdramatic classmate, Momo was covering her mouth in revulsion at the level of violence she'd just witnessed. At the same time, the mature teen could understand the tactics demonstrated. Midoriya had fought the smart way, ensuring through his control of the flow of combat that his opponent could never use his quirk to the fullest. Way to go Midoriya, Gyro praised, punching the air in excitement. It had been too long since the punk rock girl had been so electrified by a fight. Ajiro eyed his celebrating classmate with a frown. The martial artist had to use a bit of his training to keep his tail from twitching in agitation. Should you really be cheering for the villains? The tailed teen asked quietly. As much as he could agree that defeating Bakugo was a good thing, showing support for the bad guys still fell wrong. All Might, smile still in place, didn't like what he'd seen one bit. The level of hatred shown by young Bakugo, the ruthless cunning displayed by young Midoriya. It was just wrong. The pro hero could sort of understand the green-haired teen's reasoning. He'd heard how worried the boy had been over young Asui getting caught in their explosive crossfire, but to go so far as to humiliate the blonde. It left a bad feeling in the number one hero's gut. Maybe if the symbol of peace had known Izuku's capture tape had been destroyed he would have thought differently, but as the green-haired teen's communication bead had been ruined by that explosion to the face. He didn't. Sight of the foe weapon. Izukun. 
What happened? Suyu immediately asked as Izuku entered the room, his clothes burnt and in tatters. Are you all right? Kiro, the green-haired teen smiled reassuringly at his partner, thankful for her concern. He also gave a smile to T, who was sitting on a trussed-up Ada, standing guard. I'm fine. Everything hurts, but I'm fine, Izuku said, coming to stand next to the frog girl. But, that Kyugo's not coming though. Suyu frowned at this. She couldn't stop staring at her partner's belly. How could it look so unblemished yet the reinforced clothes that were supposed to protect it were a mess? What does that mean? Kiro, Suyu asked in concern. Izuku shrugged, gently lowering himself until he was sitting next to the frog girl's side. He waved a hand noncommittally through the air. I lost the capture tape, but left him with a concussion, Izuku explained as Suyu began poking his stomach in barely concealed wonder. He's not making it back this far before time runs out. We've won. From his position on the floor, looking like a mummified cocoon due to the amount of capture tape enveloping him, Ida shook his head furiously until his mouth was free. He'd have moved more, but it turned out a zombie girl weighed much more than he'd thought. Impossible. The bespectacled teen exclaimed, how could you have defeated him with such differences and quirks? In an obvious attempt at ignoring their opponent, Suyu narrowed her eyes at the object hanging from her partner's mouth. Do you smoke? The frog girl asked, making Izuku smile. Do you want one? The green-haired teen asked in return, offering up his small case. Realizing after examining the contents that her partner wasn't suggesting she take a cancer stick, but enjoy candy, Tsuyu gladly agreed. She decided a celebratory toast wouldn't kill them. After all, there was only a minute left to wait before they'd win. Through unimaginable pain and suffering, Bakugo had managed to haul himself to the second floor. He'd added to his misery each time he'd rolled down a flight of stairs, but he knew from overhearing four eyes that this was where he'd found the bomb. The world might have never stopped spinning, his head might have felt like it was going to explode any minute, and his legs might have refused to hold him even now, but the blonde was too focused on unleashing his secret weapon on the freak to notice or care. That singular purpose was why the explosive teen had crawled his way here through agony, why he'd pushed his body past its limits and stood up so he could lean against the wall for support as he hobbled along, why as he began to hear voices and laughter around the upcoming corner he redoubled his efforts to get into firing range. As the beaten down blonde turned the corner, just making out the freak's shape through the far off door, he knew. Nothing was going to stop him now. The you 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 are 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 are. The villain team wins. All Might's booming voice filling the test building was the last thing Bakugo wanted to hear. He'd lost, and now nothing could wash away his disgrace. But, as the blonde watched his nemesis from across the distance, how the freak smiled like an idiot to someone or something outside his vision, he came to a decision. Test or no test, he had to erase the cause of his life's only defeat from existence. So, Bakugo readied his bracer, cocking back the large handle, and placed his finger through the pin. Izuku had just given tea in order to free the still-fuming Ida, who looked quite upset over his embarrassing defeat, when a glint through the open doorway caught his eye. Turning, the green-haired teen had only a second to react as he saw a bloodied Bakugo aiming his grenade-like arm guard in his general direction. Using that fraction of time, the verdant hero in training pushed away a startled Suyu just as a truly cataclysmic explosion rocked the entire building to its foundation. The detonation was so massive and yield that none of the teenagers in the room could do more than flail around in the face of its might. Two support pillars took direct hits, immediately collapsing into scorched rubble and taking the ceiling and parts of the next two floors with them. Ida, having miraculously stayed conscious during the disaster, took a moment to take stock of his situation after the world stopped shaking. His ears were ringing so hard they hurt, and he could feel a wet sensation running down his face from his forehead. Ignoring what he knew that to be, the bespectacled teen tried to peer through the mountain of wreckage in the room for signs of his classmates. His stomach sank, there was nothing but rubble. That was until he caught sight of the zombie girl desperately trying to dig her way through a huge pile of debris. Midoriya, Asui, Ida shouted in horror as he realized what happened. It was like a horrible tragedy unfolding before him, thanks to the capture tape still restraining him, the bespectacled teen couldn't join the effort to save his classmates. Two new wet sensations ran down his face now, in stereo. And the speedster couldn't ignore these ones. At Hugo Bast in the aftermath of unleashing his secret weapon, drunk on the sight of such destruction, such evidence of his indisputable power. He felt like everything was back on track now, as if he was one step closer to becoming number one now that he'd finally defeated the green-haired shit-stain for good. The blonde's moment of glory was short-lived, however, as he was violently cast aside by an incoming mob. M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A. Takoyami screamed in distress as he rushed into the room, dark shadow pushing Bakugo to the side without a word so his path would be unimpeded. The raven-haired teen had been the first to dart out of the monitoring room as soon as everyone had realized that the explosive blonde really was going to launch an attack even though the test had ended. He'd been seconded by All Might, although that was only because the pro hero had spent a precious few seconds calling for Midoriya and Asui to answer their mics before running. The rest of the class had followed suit, each as worried for Izuku and Suyu as the other. What the? Bakugo was still unable to process what had just happened when he suddenly felt a powerful hand pin him down. 
Within seconds, both of his bracers had been stripped from his battered arms. The squeal and crunch of crushing metal followed by two lumps of technological slag falling to the floor in front of his face clued the bewildered blonde as to what was happening. All might knew from years of experience that the first thing to do in situations like this was to neutralize any danger of a second offensive, no matter how much the desire to save lives tugged at the heartstrings. That's why the number one hero had opted for restraining Bakugo and destroying his weapons before joining the rescue effort Wana had begun. Worse still, he knew he couldn't punch his way out of this, couldn't smash his way to a day saved. That would more than likely cause further harm to come to his buried students. They're still alive, Gyro exclaimed, having plugged her ear jacks into the mountain of rubble. Using her quirk, the punk rock girl located the pair with ease, directing her classmates to help T. Surprisingly, the zombie girl was digging in the right direction. Beneath the wreckage, two pillars had collided with the fake bomb, tearing through the papier mash with ease, but still allowing enough drag to slow their collapse enough to create a small cavern between them. A single surviving light bulb flickered in the hollow, dangling from sparking wires. A dying light, as pitiful as it was, was enough for the two occupants of the space to take stock of their situation. When she could think again after the chaos of the explosion, Suyu examined herself as best she could. One of her arms was broken, if the bone sticking out was any indication, and she couldn't feel her legs. Normally that would have sent the frog girl into a blinding panic, but there was worse news. A large piece of rebar was sticking out of her stomach, and she could clearly see blood leaking out of the wound. Feeling the panic coming now, Tsuyu was distracted by movement to her left. Managing to turn her head just enough, she saw her partner. Izuku was a mess. One of his arms was nothing but char, and a fragment of glass was embedded in his right eye. Rabar had also pierced through the green-haired teen in multiple places. Remarkably, there was only a small amount of blood around him though. I, Izu, Izu-kun. Tsuyu rasped out, hoping to get her partner's attention. Izuku suddenly moved, reaching for the glass in his eye. He gripped it tight, gave a sharp yank. God, fucking, damn it. The green-haired teen screamed, the glass leaving his eye socket without even a spurt of blood. After only a few seconds, and blinks, he opened his eye. The emerald orb was good as new. Unnoticed, the charred limb had returned to normal, unblemished except for the surrounding dust, dirt, and ash smearing on it. Seemingly in a masochistic mood, Izuku then reached behind him and pushed, forcing himself off the rebar that was impaling him. God for kingdom it. This time the curse was hissed through clenched teeth, the metal sliding through him obviously more painful than the hero in training had expected. Nevertheless, in moments he'd managed to free himself, the resulting hole slowly starting to close. Hero, Suyu's call, weak as it had been, was enough to catch Izuku's attention. Seeing the frog girl state, he quickly stumbled to her side. Taking his partner's hand in his, he gave her a reassuring squeeze before moving to apply pressure on her most grievous wound as best he could. The only thing running through the green-haired teen's mind the entire time was a single thought, this was just like tea. I'm scared. Suyu gasped through her pain, her words causing her partner to shed tears of despair. Izuku knew that rescue was on its way, but he also knew that Suyu didn't have that kind of time. She was already getting cold and all might, usually everyone's best bet for salvation, wouldn't be able to use his unbeatable strength to save them before it was too late. Fifteen minutes to dig us out, at best. Five to get you out of this spot as safely as possible. The nearest hospital is twenty. Izuku rattled off projections, unable to say what he knew was the truth. Suyu allowed her normally stoic face to smile, just a little. Gently, she used the hand of her unbroken arm to cup her partner's face, stopping his muttering completely. Wide, desperate green eyes bore into resigned black. I'm not going to make it, the frog girl said in understanding. Accepting the fact, as scary as it was, Suyu still wished she could say goodbye to her parents and siblings before she died. Her parents would be devastated, no doubt. They'd been so anxious when she'd made it clear she wanted to go to hero school, and now this. Samadair would act unaffected during the day, but she knew her little brother would cry every night in his room afterward. Satsuki wouldn't understand why Big Sis never came home from school, the little tadpole was just too innocent for that. The thought caused a tear to pearl up. She'd at least hoped she'd have her first kiss before the end. I'm not letting you die, Izuku suddenly declared, pulling out his penknife. He just had to save this girl. He couldn't lose another person. There was a slight chance if he acted now, his quirk might actually be able to help. Noticing the tiny knife in her partner's hand, Suyu looked from the blade to Izuku in confusion. Hero, the world was beginning to fade in and out, so the frog girl decided maybe she was seeing and hearing things. Despise me, forgive me, resign yourself. Izuku intoned as he cut into his left wrist, causing Suyu's eyes to widen in shock. But I take this barbarous action to save your life. Now I want you to drink. And live. Before the frog girl could react, the green-haired teen forced his bleeding wrist over her mouth, a rather large amount of the crimson liquid making it in. The two remained like that for a moment, neither moving. Perhaps it was her partner's words, perhaps it was an instinctual fear of death. Whatever the cause, Tsuyu gave into her impulse and drank. She drank deeply, with the intent to survive the day. Twenty minutes later, 
With the help of Achako and Takoyami and their quirks, the former rendering debris weightless for easy removal and the latter using dark shadow to handle large amounts of rubble. One was able to liberate their buried classmates without further issue. When the last concrete slab was raised and discarded, the class eagerly took in the forms of their missing number. Izuku cradled Suyu against his chest, what little had been left of his vest appearing to have been torn away to be used as bandages for the frog girl's wounds. Looking up at his classmates from where he crouched on in the open hollow, dried tears were clearly visible upon the green-haired teen's cheeks. It worked. Izuku breathed with a weak smile, it finally worked. The words meant nothing to the members of 1A, leaving them all standing confused in the ruined hall. While they did so, T stumbled down into the open space and took her customary place behind Izuku. Nobody noticed the zombie girl stood just a little closer to the green-haired teen than normal. Kiro, Suyu's croak received smiles from the other girls, before they noticed something odd. As the frog girl looked up at them with bleary eyes, there was no denying that what was once black was now red. Can we go to the nurse's office now? Suyu asked aloud, I don't feel very good. The comment earned sighs of relief from all present. Momo, seeing she was the closest to the two rescued classmates, was the first to offer her hand in assistance. The mature girl recognized from his drooping gaze that Izuku was too weak and too tired to be of further help. No, Suyu's scream startled everyone, the frog girl sounding as if Momo had just threatened to kill her. She clung to Izuku as if her life depended on it. Wait, whatever you do, don't separate us. Izuku warned, holding Suyu closer to his chest even as his eyes cried out his pain at what he'd had to do. I used my quirk on her, but I don't know what could happen if I'm not touching her to command my blood. I don't want her to die or become like T. It was only now that the rest of Wana noticed the blood-covered rebar that rose from the once cavern-like hungry teeth, their imaginations quickly filling in for them what had most likely happened. Worry not, my friend, Takoyami exclaimed, dark shadow rising from the avian teen's stomach. Allow me to safely ferry you away from death's ever-reaching grasp. At the raven-headed boy's direction, the shadowy quirk entity shaped its hands into massive wing-like appendages. Gently, Izuku and Suyu were scooped up, dark shadow even carving into the ground effortlessly so the two wouldn't be jostled at all. All might watch this all unfold feeling equal parts prideful and guilty, his students had reacted like real heroes in their joint effort to save their peers, but the knowledge that he was partially responsible for this tragedy was suffocating him. If he hadn't had the idea of pitting Izuku and Bakugo against one another in an effort to have the two work out their mutual hatred. The symbol of peace shook his head, barely holding onto his smile. Now he needed to prepare himself to face what was sure to be a most horrible of battles. Dealing with the parents of the victims. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku had cursed blood. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout out to Magnus9284 for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.